So All go right. ahead and got that. All right. Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. I'm your guest, John Henry Sheridan. And today I have with, with me uh, an old friend and uh, fellow music lover, Jason Bachelor. Thanks for being here, Jason. Uh, wow, it's my pleasure. How are you doing? How's everyone doing? All right. Yeah. So hello, everybody. Uh, if you're watching live, uh, please uh, chime in. And if you watch on the replay, feel free to leave some comments. But uh, usually it takes a couple of minutes for, for this to show up in people's feed. So let's, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's just get the, the banter going. So sometimes I like to start off an interview with with the guests and, and ask the question, um, if we know each other, if it's not someone new, how, how do we meet? And what what are your memory of us first first meeting if, if you have any memory a long time ago <laughs> yeah I, I don't have a specific memory <laughs> don't want to put you on the spot on that one but just out of curiosity uh well, i remember the first time i met you was in front of your house okay if mm -hmm. i remember correctly because uh i met i met your friend joey first mm -hmm. and we were hanging out for a while and then i think we just i just even went to see, like your block and then you were there with a few other if i remember correctly Mike was it? Michael Barish was there. Mm -hmm. Probably, really yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah interesting. Was, it was nighttime. I remember being nighttime. Oh yeah! Wow, I can remember that. I remember it was a Friday or Saturday night. I can't remember that. Wow, yeah, and my I would guess it must have been '95 around there, something like that. Yeah, maybe even maybe even '96. You think so? Uh, I thought I met Jeremy in '95. I could I have met Jeremy before. High, I was already a senior in high school when I met you. So really? I had to be like, I had to be like late '95, early '96 nice, around there then. Mm -hmm. so All right, because yeah, so like twenty years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, twenty-five almost, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so I, I don't. Yeah, I can't remember the specific day. Although I'm sure if, if we talked about it, it would kind of jog my memory. But I do remember. <laughs> Just kind of early days, you had your crew of kind of metal guys, but it wasn't exclusively yeah. metal. You know, sometimes you'd have friends oh, yeah, yeah. into into punk or, or whatever, but it was kind of a crew that that you you had, and uh, it was cool because my I had my own crew in a way, right? So oh, yeah, it was yeah. like this meeting of crews, uh, yeah, the John Henry Sheridan crew, <laughs> yeah, and and the Jason Bachelor gang yeah. you know so uh yeah it, it was fun to to see how these different groups of more more or less metalheads uh would oh yeah kind of came together and, and hung a, out. a large variety of metalheads too yeah like death metal and progressive metal mm -hmm. people power metal people yeah if i remember correctly you were like really into like halloween and yeah I would, then. yeah i would say yeah more like the power metal thing yeah. is probably more my favorite yeah, Halloween, Iron Maiden, but of course, Megadeth, Metallica. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And glam. You know, I like glam, too. Um, and at that time, what, what do you think you were? I remember you were the first Wasp fan I ever met. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I really met too many other Wasp fans. <laughs> no, I don't think <laughs> I did either. But uh, what other bands were you listening to at that time? Just... Oh, the same thing. Like, uh, well, I was into Iron Maiden a lot. I didn't get into Halloween really until after I met you guys. Then I got into Halloween mm -hmm. a lot more. But yeah, it was mostly Iron Maiden, Wasp, Megadeth, Metallica, Guns N' Roses. Yeah, a lot of the same, same, that, same yeah. stuff. Yeah. I think I was just getting into Bad Religion at that time, too, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. And is Bad Religion punk? Because I never quite got into it. Yeah, the yeah. punk. Mm hmm. Yeah, and was were you already into Dream Theater at that point, or did that come a little yeah. later? Yeah, My friend, uh, another guy named Jason also got me into Dream Theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I was, I think I had already known Dream Theater, and we kind of like agreed on that. Our, our groups, I, I don't remember where I was introduced to it, but uh, yeah, I remember Wake being such a such a mega album for me. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, was, uh, yeah. A week was an eye opener. <laughs> yeah, right, for sure. Um, so yeah, let, let's dive right into it. It's eight o'clock. Uh, once again, hello everybody. Anybody who's watching, uh, please feel free to to hit that love button, that like button, and uh, drop in a question or comment. Uh, as Jason and I uh, 
talk here. So Jason, can you remember what it was that got you into enjoying music in the first place? And what were some of your earliest inspirations? I think it was like a lot of random events. Like for first, I think it was just first time I really got into started getting into rock metal. It was randomly seeing a video on MTV from a from Poison on Skinny Bop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was like really because back then I, that was like when I was in seventh grade, I was listening to all like the popular stuff. Like I think like Will Smith had a popular song that summer that summer about, about summer and uh, a bunch of other stuff that I really wasn't too happy about listening to. I listened to it mm -hmm. and um, I heard on Skinny Bop, and then shortly after that was. Um, Epic from Faith No More. Mm -hmm. And then I had a friend who lived across the street of me at the time. And he just played me Appetite for Destruction from Guns N' Roses. And I was kind of like, let's seal the deal. <laughs> <laughs> with listening to that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, because uh, yeah, similar, because I was watching MTV in those early years and I definitely was moved by that, the Epic video, Faith No More. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, a lot of the stuff on there, I was like, Ugh, what, what is this? You know, like, is this music? A lot of the pop stuff I didn't dig. But yeah, of course, it just became the flavor of the month. And, you know, you took right. it for what it is. But uh, yeah, Appetite for Destruction, I, I heard pretty early on. I think roughly when those videos were coming out, 88 or so. And, um, yeah, and there was a friend across the street, pretty much, who, who uh, introduced me to that, you know. So it's funny how the uh, local... Hey groups really we had a big influence on each other at those oh at yeah that time. yeah <clears throat> um so i remember when i spoke to your brother jeremy about his memories of early music he would say that your parents listened to music a lot uh like oldies or oh yeah i'm yeah. not sure exactly what yeah I think like elvis and buddy holly and whatever was like on the station that played 50s and 60s whenever we took like long road trips Mm -hmm. I just drove anywhere that was always that would always be on it was good music you know mm -hmm. it's, it's not something i would put on on my own and listen right. to it but if someone put it on i'm not gonna i, I would enjoy it cool yeah and, and I, I must have planted a seed for the just the appreciation of, of oh, yeah. music in general i imagine yeah, yeah. um so i just want to say uh, hello to lisa markowitz tro and diana giordino giordano who are uh, hanging out with us so thank you for hanging out lisa and diana Hello. Uh, yeah, they say hi, John and Jason, and feel free to chime in to the conversation. Um, yeah, so so that what Epic came out around 1990. That that video does that sound right to you? Yeah, I think it's like 89 or 90 around there. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Right, and then Appetite. What what was your favorite song off Appetite at that? When you well, like, I mean, first heard it, was Welcome to the Jungle, I guess? Well, yeah, Welcome to the Jungle and stuff like that. But like the song that stuck out the most was uh, Rocket Queen. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, <laughs> and that's not even like one of their most popular songs. Like, you just, no. that, that, if I remember correctly, it's at the end of the album. Mm -hmm. Just something about the song that was great. Like, yeah. every, like the, probably my favorite song of the album. Yeah. I know most people say Welcome to the Jungle or Paradise City. But I don't know, man. I liked Rocket Queen a lot. <laughs> And Mr. Brownstone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could definitely see Rocket Queen. I, I uh, had I had a period where I, I kind of felt like, oh man, this is the undiscovered jewel on the album. Yeah. You know, and kind of the most, possibly the most positive song on there. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> kind yeah. Of. Maybe even the most melodic song too on there. Yeah, very melodic. Really cool, tasty yeah. riffs. You know some it more most evolved involved uh songwriting yeah. maybe it, it's a weird song because it, it sounds like it belongs in the album and also at the same time it sounds like it doesn't belong in that album yeah it does it, kind of stick out yeah it's a very weird song but amazing song mm -hmm. yeah well, i haven't talked about that song in a while and <laughs> uh yeah i haven't thought about it. and um mr brownstone too is a weird song i mean yeah. it def certainly sounds like it fits on the album but strange song like i heard it recently came on like 80s maybe i put an 80s playlist on spotify or something and mm -hmm. my mother and my uh, wife heard it and they didn't really know it <laughs> and i was oh, yeah. yeah it was quiet enough that they didn't hear the, the lyrics really but i explained kind of what it was about and i don't know if they liked it you know and not that they should or shouldn't but uh i don't know what it is that's appealing about it but i like it right and, and you like it and yeah 
it doesn't have that universal appeal like something Sweet Child Minor. Welcome no, to Jungle I mean the, the only way you could tell it's a Guns N' Roses song is you hear Axel's voice. Yeah, mm-hmm. the only way you know it's a Guns N' Roses song. Other than that, it's also a song that doesn't really go with the rest of the album, but at the same time, it does. Yeah, yeah, it's it's got that niche niche sort of flavor. Yeah, it's just the I mean, Appetite is one of those amazing albums you're never gonna hear again, and that's never gonna be created like that again. No, no. <laughs> Certain, just a moment in time, yeah. very unique. Um, so yeah. So uh, what about Metallica? When did you start hearing Metallica? Out of curiosity. Uh, that would be this, definitely was eighth grade when I started paying attention to like MTV's top ten. Mm-hmm. It was that time where like it was always a, a war between Guns N' Roses and Nirvana for the number one spot, and Metallica would always be on there too. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So, <laughs> I think it was. It was either Nothing Else Matters or Enter Salmon at the time that was on that top 10 constantly, too. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, I remember the top 10. There was the, uh, like, the top 10, and there was dial in TV. Do you remember dial in TV? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was like a top 10, but apparently <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was kind of listener's choice type of thing. Um, yeah, I remember being, like, pretty bummed out, like, because Guns N' Roses held the spot for a while. I found, like, I'm guessing it was 91, 92, and... And then one day just Smashing Pumpkins had it and then and then yeah. Nirvana had it. I don't know what was the order, but and I was just like, I was disappointed, but I couldn't help. It. I kind of liked Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins a bit. I didn't love it, but but I was disappointed that Metallica and Guns N' Roses were kind of slipping. Yeah. It was yeah, that, that was a that was changing of like kind of like changing of the guard for music like that we were witnessing. Yeah, yeah, it was. Wow. Yeah, for, for better or worse, you know, it had to evolve in uh, yeah. evolve. Yeah. 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 I think one of the highlights of that era for me musically was uh, I did. I was very impressed by Nevermind album in terms of like I'm influenced by it. But right. uh, definitely Pearl Jam's Alive when that came out. I yeah. really thought the guitar sound was great. And the song. Yeah. I don't know. It just kind of really stuck with me. Vocals were so was, crazy that album, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's really really great yeah they really stuck out like what what nobody ever nobody sings like that you know i never heard anyone <laughs> sing like that before you know no yeah that was a well for us here in new york that was the first time i mean i'm pretty mm-hmm. sure people in la were hearing that for a while already mm-hmm. and certainly in seattle right? yeah well, seattle yeah um but uh yeah and and then i think i got that album was one of the first 10 albums mm-hmm. i got was it was 10 I remember because I fit in that like tiny cassette right. like, yeah. thing, <laughs> just a few cassettes you know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> What, what were some of your first uh, cassette tapes? Uh, well, the first single I bought was uh, on Skinny Bop. Mm-hmm. Uh, boy, and like, the first full album cassette I bought was uh, Faith No More. The real thing. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. That must have been early in my collection, too. Yeah, it was... Damn, I think my third one was... I would say Metallica, but I think my brother got the Metallica first. Mm-hmm. And we just kind of like listen to each other's cassettes, really. Right. And you get the the black album would be the first one. Yeah. What's we'll that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Black album was my first purchase metallic album, but my uncle actually gave me a, a black Memorex blank tape cassette version of Injustice for All in oh, like '89. Wow. He's like, <laughs> he's this big, you know, big Italian guy. He goes, John, John, you got to hear this, you know. And I was like eight years old. You know, and it just struck me as like, oh, do I like this? You know, like, <laughs> but when one when one came on, I'm like, I like this. You know, the clean tone, yeah, one, on the melody. Yeah. But the rest of it took me took some getting used to. But then then it became one of my favorites. Oh yeah, it's it's a favorite gem. sound. Yeah, it's one of those albums that took me a while to get into too. Mm-hmm. But the, the song on that album that actually sold me on that album was, was Dyer's Eve. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a song that that sold me on that album. Yeah, that's that's relentless, right? Did it, did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just doesn't from beginning to end, just doesn't stop. No, it reminds me a little bit of Damage Incorporated, in the similar yeah. like in it was oh, just yeah, definitely like, same. Oh, brutal yeah. straight from beginning to end, like no breaks. Yeah, <laughs> and and the end of the album too. Yeah. Um, so Deanna says uh, that I remember you from high school. Uh, Jason, and are you a guitarist or a bassist, or are you a guitarist and bassist? Well, I mean, I always I learned guitar mm-hmm. pretty much 
since I was 14. And, but every time I was in a full band, it was to play bass. Okay. <laughs> that just, it always happened that way. I mean, because guitarists are a dime a dozen, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, <laughs> But yeah, the right. few times I was in a band, it was to play bass. Mm -hmm. and, and if I remember correct, was it, did you have several basses? I remember the Warlock bass, was that yours? Or was that a Warlock guitar? I had a Warlock guitar, yeah. Guitar, okay. okay. Had, for the bass, I had the five string, the uh, Epiphone, Firebird Epiphone. Uh-huh, okay. I bought that off my brother. Oh, right, yeah, so I'm I sure. I got it from his bass teacher, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay, yeah, I'm sure I would recognize if I saw it. Uh, Cool. So um, I think you already answered this. So if not, we could just move on. But when did you start listening to music on your own? Like what age was it, would you say? Uh, like stuff that wasn't popular that I wasn't expected. People weren't expected to listen to. It would be about seventh grade towards the end of my seventh grade. So I think I was like 11, 12 years old. Okay. So that's when you kind of begin to have your own opinions about things yeah. and, and shape so it yourself. I identify more with the rock and metal crowd. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit familiar, a bit similar to me. Um, I kind of got into metal around that time, like kind of wholeheartedly around that age yeah. 11 or so. But I was, I, I was exposed to it a couple of years before that through my uncle and through the kids on the block when it was big in the late 80s. But then right. there was that like this period of 1990 where I was everybody dance now, whatever. I just went back into this oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pop world. Cause I was a kid. I never, I didn't make my identity with music until I became about 11 or 12. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I had, I had heard Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue and uh, Anthrax and yeah. stuff like it that. Was, it was always there growing up, like, oh, kind of like the background. Like, yeah. The, you didn't really pay attention to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Actually, I remember when, in the late 80s my friends were getting into this stuff and someone has a poison shirt someone had a motley crew shirt or whatever yeah and they were trying to get me into it like peer pressure and i was resisting when i was like seven or eight you know i, I remember saying to the guys i'm like i don't like the i don't like this stuff they look like girls i listen to <laughs> opera that's what i said <laughs> it's not true i didn't but i just wanted to like uh you know uh oh, yeah, i was an advocate of age okay you can't you don't really care about that stuff at that, at that time. Yeah, no, I, I didn't. Uh, so Deanna says, what was the most challenging bass line you ever played? Hmm. Oh, man, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't tell There's you. actually one in um, a band I was in for a few months around 2010. It, was, mm -hmm. it wasn't really like a hard bass line, which was very awkward in timing. Mm -hmm. It took me a while to get, but then once you got it, I can't even, I can't remember how it sounded. I can't even hum it, hmm. but it was just, it wasn't complicated physically. It was just very awkward timing. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. The riff that stands out to me, bass line, I mean, playing jazz, I played jazz and jazz bands. Probably everything then. <laughs> yeah, so that that gave me a run for my money for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, but again, that was similar to your situation that guitarists were a dime a dozen or in the case of jazz, Basses are just valued a lot more. Oh yeah, know, yeah. That's than the a, guitarist by and large. Like all of jazz and blues. Yeah, it's so yeah, important. <laughs> so, yeah, that like always challenged me. But on guitar, I just remember having a lot of put a lot of effort into learning uh, "Holy Wars" on guitar, like just the verse riff. Yeah, yeah. A solid hour just to get it down. And uh, I found that, the verse riff harder than the intro riff. <laughs> Yeah, I would that's say awesome. so, which is ridiculous because he's singing yeah. over it, you know. <laughs> uh, that stands out. And anything from that album really was a challenge, but but oh. that uh, that particular riff, I, I really learned it well, but it took a long time. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, she's, Deanna says, time signatures can get weird. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think the song Five Magics off uh, Megadeth. That, that was, yeah, that was a... That was a cool song. Oh, yeah, I think it was in five four or parts of it too, and because it's a little bit. Yeah, it went this, through, yeah, it went through a few changes. Yeah, a few you know. Just like it wasn't a hard song to play, but it was a hard song to keep time with at first. Yeah, right, exactly. Correctly, yeah. So, um, what? Okay, 
again, I think you, we covered this a bit, but if there's any more you could add, what were some of your favorite bands growing up? So we said Guns N' Roses, Metallica, Megadeth, Wasp. Yeah. Any well, other yeah, bands? Wasp was a huge influence for quite a while. And, uh, then Maiden took over. I don't know, it's like just out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I think the most important band I, I would ever listen to, I think we all got into that band the same day on eight, when they played them on 89.5, is Amorphous. <laughs> right. A song Black Winter Day, which that song set me on a completely different metal path because then I was like, the song was so heavy and so melodic and dark at the same time. You just didn't really hear that then. Yeah. Like oh, most okay. death metal bands back then were not melodic. They were just, you know, da -da 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 pounding away and mm -hmm. on the guitar. And that actually sent me in the path of the type of metal I'm into now. And then you discover, you know, from there I went from In Flames to Dark Tranquility to now, like, for me, who the greatest band of all time is Elevati. Oh, yeah. I don't Pagan think uh, metal band. Yeah, I think you might have played, I, th I think I might have heard about them from you a little while ago, but I, I don't yeah. really know them particularly well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember I was at Joey's house when I first heard Amorphous, and it was winter. And yeah. it was kind of yeah. like a blue sky out, you know, a, a purple sky. And I remember hearing this song. He may have gotten the cassette tape that Jeremy taped off the radio and lent them. I don't remember. Or you did. But if I remember correctly, we all heard it because I remember hearing it in the middle of the week and then somehow, for some reason, we were all hanging out that weekend, if I remember correctly. And like, we all said, oh, you got to hear this amazing song. And someone was like, oh, what was it? Amorphous Black Winter Day. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one moment where you just were all listening to the radio at the same time and then it came on. Mm -hmm. and like, Yeah, you know, it, I, sound, it sounds right. I never heard a song so, like before that, though. I just, it just grabbed me from beginning to end. And I was like, oh, I don't want it to be over. I got to find this band. And then like two weeks later, I, I randomly found that album in zigzags used for like $6. Oh, oh nice. You found like, holy crap, this is it. And, you know, back then you couldn't just go online and download music. No, definitely so. not. And, and uh, so Deanna's saying, can you type the name of the song in the band? So I'm putting it down, Amorphous Black Winter Day. Oh, man. Yeah. It's also that song. I don't know if you notice but it i think it's a nine eight it's in a slightly weird it's definitely yeah. not in the metal signature time signature it's got like a three four feel but it's also got this rolling thing so i think it's nine eight and uh and play, you know so like to have this like growling singer plus uh plus this very musical lilting melody the guitars are so so thick and just and they're melodic too yeah, like, like nothing flashy, nothing, yeah. nothing that trying to impress anyone with uh, skill, just like creating really yeah beautiful music. And with the and keyboard the, in the background, the that that melody melody it had was like kind of like I want to say folksy, but like maybe like folk, like medieval yeah. folk. Oh yeah, yeah for sure, and and <laughs> or protect, perhaps Finnish folk. You know, I think Finnish yeah, folk has that, yeah, that Finnish vibe. Folk. You know. Uh, yeah, that that Moog sound just hooked me. I listened to uh, Amorphous yesterday, uh, one of the newer songs, but it did have a a, a Moog kind of moment at the end, and you know it wasn't quite the nine, early '90s Amorphous, but it was cool just having that spot space for that that keyboard yeah. sound, you know. And it was what it was also I loved about Amorphous was there was this sense that you could play it, you know, it was playable. Yeah. If you could figure it out. It was tricky, but, you know, they, they were it detuned. A tiny bit, but mm -hmm. once you get it, it wasn't hard to play physically, just yeah. the timing. <laughs> yeah, the timing and, and to figure out the tuning, too, sometimes was a little tricky oh, for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it I wasn't think that was, standard. No, it wasn't. And we couldn't, they weren't, like, famous enough to be in a guitar magazine, so, like, we couldn't figure out <laughs> right. what that tuning was. Well, what was it? Was it C? Yeah, I feel like it was, it was D, C. D, drop C. Drop, so yeah, yeah drop, D, drop C. Yeah. D with the drop C. That's what I think it was. At least yeah. that album. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then the next album, I mean, for me, Elegy, I'm on some level, I like even oh, more than, uh, yeah. uh, maybe even more than Tales from the Thousand Lakes. Tales from the Thousand Lakes was a very definitive statement. You know, it's yeah. kind, of, kind of like Injustice for All to me. It just really had this yeah. similar vibe throughout that that was very just consistent the whole journey felt like it was one journey yeah i had yeah. the same feel from beginning to end just i was just a masterpiece 
Yeah, and the album artwork matched the vibe so well, oh. right? Oh yeah, <laughs> that was a great, great cover, great album art. Yeah, uh, I, I posted um, a Beauty and Chaos, which is my for, oh, wow. for listeners, my my uh, high school metal band uh, cover of uh, Into Hiding um, not too long ago. So it's on YouTube. Oh, I gotta check um, that out. <laughs> yeah, it's like within a, a a demo that I just like an archive demo, but Into Hiding's on the playlist, and it's fun to to hear, you know. Oh yeah. Of course, we do it way too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then, you get any own flavor to it so yeah yeah i even kind of like sang a melody for the the verse but you know it's, it's like the growling but i sang it with the melody that i just kind of heard was there although it's not there anyway it was fun so deanna says uh so she's checking out amorphous and she says then you must love dream theater uh i guess uh, that's directed to you everything from Images to scenes from my memory, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, I respect everything else they've done after that. It's, it's amazing, but it's kind of like after I got into Elevati, because they uh, they don't use keyboards. They have like a lot of traditional pagan folk instruments. Like they have a hurdy gurdy player, a flute player. Mm -hmm. The singer plays the mandola and the harp, and occasionally um, bagpipes when he's not singing. Mm -hmm. They have a violinist, and so like I never knew metal could be so organic sounding. Not Mm -hmm. synthesized and so when i go back to listen to stuff with keyboards like dream theater or cradle of filth i can still listen to them but not as long as i used to be able to yeah wow that's cool so yeah okay yeah so you did tell me about that band i met at, at uh, our mutual friend steve's party a long time ago because yeah. you showed a video on there i'm like what the heck is this and you were telling me about it yeah yeah so yeah that, that that's very cool um similarly uh, when did scenes from memory come out do you remember Oof. was that uh, 90s late, yeah it was late 90s right because i do remember that and it, i guess after that yeah i can't tell you what album came next i know octavarium was in there somewhere it had to be um, like late it was definitely because i remember when the live when they did the tour for that they released a live cd and they delayed the album cover of it because of september 11th oh okay because it had like the whole new york city skyline with the dream theater heart and there was fire around it mm -hmm. so i remember if it was delayed or they were going to change it but they still released it i can't remember but it was like around that time so scenes remember had to be the year before that maybe so like maybe 99 2000 okay yeah i guess that's probably would have been around the time that i stopped uh paying attention to to a lot of things really um but yeah including dream theater of, of course i have still listened to them and i respect yeah. what they've done too but i don't put it on my friend sent me a link to they just put out a new song called alien i don't know if you heard it yet Can i heard it uh, yesterday i listened to it oh yeah What'd great beginning think? it was a good beginning i'm not a really big fan of libri on vocals oh is a different guy no. on vocals now no it's still james libri oh libri oh i, I didn't hear yeah, oh, okay. libri. Fan of his. yeah i could see what you're saying i, I get a little <clears throat> tired of it you know um at the beginning so, of the song the intro of the song is great all right i'll check that out uh she then deanna says uh who is that who is flutes i guess she, uh, so elevate how do you spell that it's l-e-u l-e-u -E 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 no e-i-t-i-e i've been listening for so long i sometimes forget how to spell their name <laughs> like the okay. first song i ever heard from them was omnos omnos Omnos, O M N O S. It's all it's all strict like they're because they also release just folk albums with no heavy guitars. So that's the first song I ever heard from them. I, I fell in love with it, but I got so obsessed with that album I didn't check out anything else. And then one day, my brother somehow got free tickets to their show, so I'm like, hell yeah, I'll go. And they open up with the song um, "A Thousand Fold," which was the full band heavy guitars, and I was just like, holy crap, they get heavy too. <laughs> and it's like, what a way to experience that for the first time live. And wow. then. I went home and just downloaded all their albums. Wow. Cool. Yeah, definitely check them out. I always take notes uh, during an interview. Yeah. And I'll put that in the show that, notes. That's really the band that, that helped me just like love music again. Because for a while there, I just didn't give a crap about music. Like at yeah. all. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could understand how that happens. Uh, so I got into them about happens. 2010. I got into 
got into them. About oh. two two thousand, you said? Yeah, two thousand ten. I got into them. Oh, with yeah. another band too, which is also another band that's on the opposite end of the, the metal spectrum with the Eyes Set to Kill. You know, just a regular four piece band. They started off as sounding emos first, and they started, got got more into rock and metal sounding later on. So I yeah, I'm just taking notes so I can put in the show. Uh, Eyes Set to Kill, you said? Yeah, yeah. The first song I ever heard from them was Broken Frames. Broken frames. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what? Where are they from? Uh, I remember they're somewhere from the Midwest, I believe. They're American band. I love okay. 80s Switzerland. Finland, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, Switzerland. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I think a lot about Celts and like Celtic stuff, and uh, some of the songs they sing in um, the old language of Gaul. Oh wow, that's great! So, that's pretty wild. That reminds me of uh, I've I don't know if you remember my friend Cahal from Ireland. Have you had a chance to meet him at some point? I think I remember you talking about. Him. I don't think yeah. I ever met him. A drummer. He's a super. He's a killer metal drummer, like even even speed metal, and uh, he was in a band called Pagan Rain in Ireland. Oh, and nice. then then there's uh, his brothers in a band called uh male morga or mal morga i don't know if i'm saying it right it's actually uh in the irish language and a lot of their music is in gaelic and oh, wow. they actually do this old gaelic makeup when they when they perform live with some of the traditional instruments and stuff oh i gotta check that out yeah male morga i should put that in the show notes too you can uh, reference the show notes uh you know ben I, I in terms of falling in love with music again uh um, uh, metal anyway uh, you ever hear Omnium Gatherum I've heard of them I haven't had a chance to listen to them yet highly recommend it uh, I saw them with Dark Tranquility and Amorphous with uh, with my friend Khan um, the bass player in 2018 and uh, um I don't know. They look like they're having so much fun, similar to how Morpheus has so much fun when they play. Yeah, yeah. And so I decided, let me just check it out. I don't know. I like the I like the show live, and I listen down. You know, listen to an album. And I was walking. It was cold day, and I was walking a long way. And just I think that added to it to my liking of it. Maybe it's good to to listen to outside while moving. You know, gotcha. if, you, <laughs> if you listen to it quietly in your house while you're doing something, maybe not. But outside while moving, kind of loud enough to feel it. It was cool. I mean, especially if you like the growling vocals, it helps. Um, it's similar to Amorphous in that the lyrics aren't just, they're not just like angry and, and negative or gross. They're, they're actually like very poetic and deceiving. You know, like Amorphous is this poetry, sound, like it sounds like a troll singing poetry, you know, essentially. Um, and uh, so this band, Omnium Gatherum, also from Finland has a little bit of that like very kind of positive stuff it's, it's not negative i would say but it's very aggressive and uh the guitar playing is outrageous and super melodic a lot of beautiful keyboard stuff that is not like the flashy keyboard of a um, dream theater it's more like this textural atmospheric keyboard a little bit more like amorphous style a little different okay. i don't know you might dig oh, i'll it. give them a check out yeah yeah um Deanna says, Do you like ours? I don't know. I guess that's a band. Ours. Ours. O U R S. Oh no, I don't know if I've ever heard them. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, I guess we didn't ever heard of them, Deanna. Um, so so Jason, how would you describe the influence music has had on your life? Well, well, things like Iron Major, for instance, helped me pass history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've seen a lot, a lot of historical events. Um, it's, yeah. it's great. It helps you control your mood, get you into a better mood, you can listen to songs that you relate to, and just helps you get past a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, especially last year in the pandemic, you know, after being locked up in your home, music was uh, <laughs> very helpful. Especially music, like listening to bands like Eluvedi that just has this, they're a nine piece band, and all, all nine instruments in there. And, Every time I listen to it, I'm noticing something new, a line I didn't hear before. 
and it just you know makes you feel like you're outside mm -hmm. so when you feel like you're trapped inside it's great music to listen to when you feel like you're out in the world yeah. like in a music world where you just it's constantly something new every time mm -hmm. yeah right very organic like you said yeah uh, yeah folk music tends to have that that it's feeling just so much to the background just going on mm -hmm. cool yeah i'm gonna definitely revisit that give that a good listen um yeah would you would you is it fair to say that music gave you some direction in your life oh yeah it definitely mm -hmm. helps out a lot especially when you're going through things where you need to to uh summon the strength and courage to do that music and help with that easily mm -hmm. i especially find uh, another band i love aiming the mark they're viking metal so i never need to pump myself up to deal with something and i'll mm -hmm. always listen to them <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah right but, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's like yeah I, I feel like that's like berserker music right like before you go to battle that's what yeah. it must have felt like yeah <laughs> that's the type of thing that the vikings must have done to pump people up oh yeah yeah they're, they're pretty uh pretty intense um yeah i'm just taking notes so i'll put that in the show notes i'm on a marth um and uh, Deanna wonders if those are real swords behind you. Uh, no, I mean, they're just model swords. I mean, the blades are metal, but not sharp. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can sharpen them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, good for I mean, the, the, middle, the middle one is fairly sharp, so mm -hmm. I could do some damage with it, not much. <laughs> <laughs> you could have definitely bang someone over the head with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so... Uh, so I guess I, you kind of spoke to it already, but uh, can you say a little bit about the power of music in general? So beyond just what it's done for you, what do you think is the value or the power of, of music in the world? Uh, communication, for, for one thing, helps you communicate how they're feeling. They can't put it into words. They can either write a song or play a song for somebody that it helps them describe if they can't get it out themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you, uh, do you think, uh, I don't know. I I've seen a lot of articles and stuff that tout the benefits of music. And I think a lot of it holds true in terms of like helping people process math, uh, helping, uh, people just dis learn discipline, right. The discipline oh, yeah. instrument or, or teamwork, working in a band. Or, oh yeah. Yeah. That, that's ensemble. huge, huge lessons you can learn from that. And you can apply that to real life too. Mm-hmm. And, and even like paying attention, right? Because if you oh, really yeah. like music, you learn how to really f sharpen your focus to, to say, what is it going on there? What instrument yeah. is that? And, oh, yeah. You know. you'll, you'll hear stuff that the people who don't play instruments won't hear and won't pick up on. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, I like, but I think both opinions are, are both equally important. Because sometimes someone who isn't a musician will point out something about a song you didn't pick up on because you're focusing too much on one area of how they put the song together, the timing of it, everything like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're not just taking in the song. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, that is, uh, that is angry. I, I, I wasn't even thinking about that. Right. <laughs> like sometimes like I, what I got into recently is watching reaction videos on YouTube of people who aren't into metal, but they're reacting to metal songs and they'll point out stuff that I didn't even realize about some songs. <laughs> right. so that's a good point. <laughs> like someone from a different walk of life, like they'll have like sometimes a title be like hip hop fan listens to such and such mm -hmm. for, like, for the first time. Then they, they, they speak about their experience listening to it, what they felt during listening to it. And it's, yeah. it could be eye opening. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen a few of them. I, one few that stand out is um, yeah, hip hop. These two hip hop fans listening to uh, I think it was Holy Wars from Megadeth. <laughs> it was so funny. Oh, is that the, is that the two guys from the something vegas yeah from vegas yeah, vegas. yeah, yeah those yeah. guys those guys are huge <laughs> yeah and their reaction to holy wars was just it yeah. was just great for someone who loves holy wars to hear to hear it's like verification like okay i thought this was one of the greatest thrash songs for a reason because right. these guys are seeing it too they yeah. also reviewed master puppets which i guess would be yeah, yeah a competitor for one of the greatest thrash songs out yeah. there and uh yeah, like what they point out, like you said, it's just not what I would 
think, you know, it, it's a yeah. lot more, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use the word basic, but like, just like what hits them instantaneously, you know, and they just. Right. Like, and it's like the same stuff that could hit us instantaneously too, as being, as being musicians and metal fans. That mm -hmm. someone who isn't, two guys who aren't musicians or into metal were able to recognize what made that song so amazing and great. Right. Um, and they, it for the first time. Mm -hmm. And maybe even put it into language that a lot of other people could relate to. Right. That we can't necessarily vocalize, you know, we wouldn't think of that, those words or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a lot of them now are not a lot of the reactors now are doing Nightwish. I guess that's another big band that oh, yeah. people are reacting to. And this Floyd Jansen's vocals just blows everybody away. <laughs> oh yeah. Hmm. But she's probably for me, she's probably the greatest vocalist in metal right now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Was she the is Nightwish the one that um was did they have the one female vocalist the whole time or has it changed? No, this she's the third singer. She used Sorry. to be in another band that came out in the early millennia too, like after forever, when the whole like opera metal thing was just starting to hit the US. Yeah, mm -hmm. like after forever, Epica, Nightwish, Within Temptation, like all those bands. Okay. So this is the third singer. Hmm. Wow. Well, the other singer is really good too. Oh yeah. The, well, the first singer, Taria, she's also an opera singer. She's opera trained, so is Floor. Their second singer is weird because she was more of like a like a power metal rock singer. Mm -hmm. So this thing, her try to do the older songs, it's a little awkward, but the songs she wrote with the band were amazing. Oh, okay. Interesting. But, and I also understand that uh, Arch Enemy had a few singers, right? Not just yeah. one. They've had, uh, they're on the third one. As far as I know, their third one, who used to be the singer for The Agonist. Mm -hmm. The Agonist is another great band. I think they're from Canada. Uh, female singer. She does both clean and growls like really well too. She's amazing at it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I kind of like the new singer in the Agonist better. They got they, with this new singer, they got a little more melodic. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Than they did with the uh, previous singer. But the, the other singer, she made art to me. She made Arch Enemy better. Mm -hmm. uh, so which so you like the newest singer the most? For Arch Enemy, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, again, just uh, taking notes to mention it after Arch Enemy and you said Nightwish, right? Yeah, Nightwish. Um, is Nightwish Finnish? I don't remember. Yeah, they're, they're from, from they're from Finland. Uh, so Deanna says, um, I never thought of musical skills as transferable skills. Wow, very good point. Um, and that if you listen to Vitamin String Quartet's version of some pop and rap songs, you'll be shocked. And then she shares ours.net. So right, check those out. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so can you speak a bit about your memories of some of your favorite live music experiences? Yeah, I would definitely be seeing Pink Floyd at Yankee Stadium. I think it was in 90, maybe 94. Hmm. Oh, that was a great, that was a great experience. And wow. then, uh, <clears throat> next one would probably be white zombie at roseland it's just the vibe of that show was amazing and i guess that was mid 90s or something yeah i was thinking if i remember correctly i was a, ju a junior in high school for that one and mm -hmm. then um it was seeing what then it was seeing wasps live for the first time and i actually got to catch blackie Lowell's pick at that show hmm. i didn't catch it directly it landed in the middle of a pit and I just kind of dove in and, and, and grabbed it and knocked two guys down doing it unintentionally. <laughs> well, <laughs> unintentionally. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> then seeing Elevati for the first time live, that was probably the, the top. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, have you seen Amorphous live? I did. Um, oh, I think we saw it together, right? Go up there. And then you, you, I think you guys drove me home. <laughs> so I was so drunk yeah, that yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think, I think uh, they, who opened it? That was also when Moonspell played too, right? It was then Moonspell. Yeah. And it was a good show. Who was the third band? Yeah, I remember the was third Covenant? band. Covenant? That sounds right. That sounds right, yeah. I think I've seen Moonspell twice at Lemoore's, if I remember correctly. And Covenant was at one of those shows. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the one because that yeah. sounds right. 
I don't know what they sound like, but I remember they played. Yeah. So Covenant, Moonspell, and then Amorphous went on. And for me, I was just, I maybe like when you first saw Elevator, you, you, you know. You oh yeah. Cause that was the first, at that time, that was the first time seeing Amorphous. And that was like, that was amazing. Cause it's like, like I said, that's the band that set me on the path I am now with music. Mm-hmm. And so that led me to like, like I said, Flames, Archer, Cradle, Cradle, Moonspell. Mm-hmm. Eventually led me to Elevati. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, that show, that Amorphous show. I'm guessing it was 2000. Yeah, it was. I think it was 2000 because. Uh, it's like 99 yeah. or 2000, I think. Well, I know that I had broken up with my girlfriend at, before that because I was really, I was, I started crying at the show. There's a mix of being upset by that, plus being so happy to see him watch this. Yeah, and yeah, being no, drunk. yeah and I, I was crying. And <laughs> I went, I went to to them backstage afterwards in Lemoore's, and I was like, "I love you guys." Cry. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you know, they said nice to meet you and shook my hand and everything. Um, yeah, if I if I'll probably if I ever do get to meet of eighty, which I was going to do, I bought tickets for the show last September. And I actually sprung extra for the VIP tickets, like I meet them. And of course, the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. And I was like, of course. And another one of my absolute favorite bands was opening for them, Infected Rain. And uh, I've gotten to meet them both. Mm. And I was looking forward to telling Elevidi how much their their music has had an effect on me and everything mm-hmm. like that. But it's damn pandemic. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see if we get a chance, another chance one day. <clears throat> Eventually, oddly enough, there, there was also one of the last few shows I went to before the pandemic hit. Oh yeah, yeah. What was Elevati? Was that, yeah, it was Elevati, and it was like uh, in October the year before in 2019. It was Elevati and Eamon and Marth, and then I got to see Epica in January of 2020, which was my mm-hmm. first time finally seeing Epica. I was trying to see him for like 10 years at that point. Wow. Every time they would open up for another band, or they would have to cancel for some reason, I'd be like, oh, of course, every time. But this time they were the headliner, so I was like, I know they're not canceling this time. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, so just <laughs> shout out to everyone who's watching. Thank you for watching live and or on the replay. And feel free to leave comments. Deanna, thank you so much for enriching our conversation with your yes. you know, com- many comments. Um, so Jason, I remember a couple, I think you and me mm-hmm. went to our, quite a few shows, not necessarily together, but we were at the same shows. Yeah. Uh, I definitely remember that you went to Halloween um, at oh, yeah, Coney Island High. High. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then, that was the first show in the U.S. in like, what was it, like 10, 11 years or something like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And I and, remember I said, like, hope they open up with Eagle Fly Free. And you're like, ah, oh, they probably won't. That's long ago. <laughs> and what did they open with? Eagle did, Fly did Free. Yeah. Wow, that's great. <laughs> um, oh, man, that, that that was quite a show. And I actually had it in my, uh, in my journal. So I, I could give you the date on that. It was like. December 19th, 98, somewhere around there. Oh, wow. The end of December, 98. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Oof. yeah. And I remember just how much fun they were having. Uh, oh, that was a fun show. Mike, um, Michael, uh, no, not Mike Kiska, Michael Weeketh. Like, he had this kind of like Pete Steele demeanor, like, you know, like grumpy. And mm-hmm. then, he had, like, 45 minutes in, he was smoking a cigarette. He smiles and you're like, ah, yeah, I knew you were having fun. <laughs> you're just trying to like hide it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was your image. You know, that's funny. Yeah, that, was a show. that was a great show. I remember my ears bleeding from everyone singing along. Uh, oh. It was so smelly in there. So many sweaty guys. <laughs> Me- that's most metal shows, though. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a metal. Yeah, that was a real metal show. Especially in Irving Plaza. That place is. And this wasn't Coney on High. Irving right. Plaza is just another place that just. Ugh so hot in there <laughs> and then I, I remember seeing uh uh i saw cradle of filth once at uh, tramps were you at that show yeah, yeah. Uh, that, i think that was when i was still doing that b cat show with canela and uh-huh. uh, it, and they allowed us to record like the first three songs i think it was the tramp show if i remember correctly i think it was that one mm-hmm. yeah that was the first that was the first show in new york like ever i think like that, that, that clothing store, uh, CD shop, Lethalwear was helping sponsor mm-hmm. it. Oh, right. Or they helped put it together or something like that. There's, there's a cool site. I don't know if you're aware about it. It's called uh, Set 
set.fm or setlist.fm. I'll try to put it in the show notes. Basically, you can go type in a, a band, type in a year or a city, and it'll list like all the shows they did in that city if someone uh, if someone made a post. So like, right. let's say if you remember, if you have this ticket stub, you know the exact date, you remember some of the set list, you can make a post for that show and then it'll appear and then other people can just add to it the set list and not much more than that. But, uh, you know, so a lot of these, I've been writing my autobiography and a lot of shows them would be helpful if I knew what year they were or what month. And right. through this, this cool website, you could find it out. So that's how I found out the tramp show. Uh, and, um, which I think I wrote it down somewhere. It's, it, I think that was 98. And um, the uh, Coney Island show, that was in my journal, but it's cool. You know, you could kind of discover things. We could, well, I'm sure a, the Amorphous a, show might be in there. I have a book of like, the ticket stubs that I used to put in. Some of them you can still clearly see. Some of them are faded. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. If you're, so yeah, so maybe if you could find that Tramp show, I'd be curious. I think it was I October. Think we, we, didn't get, we didn't get tickets for that show. We just uh, uh, mm -hmm. kind of let us in. <laughs> Um, so do you remember seeing Amorphous in, on Long Island at any point? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, Halloween in Long Island? No, I've only seen Halloween once, unfortunately. Once? Okay. Yeah. So I saw him in Long Island one time. I really can't remember who I went with. I thought maybe you were there, but no. I know we took a Long Island trip at least once or twice together, right? Like Amityville? Yeah, I think it was just driving around and listening to music. Yeah, just hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Hey, Darlene. Uh, Darlene's chiming in with the dancing cat. Very cool. Thank you for hanging out with us, Darlene. She also shared the flyer. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and Deanna is asking, Infected Rain? I know them. So what, what style of music are they? Uh, I mean, the, the term for them gets the new metal, the NU. Metal oh, okay. Gets around a lot for them. They're from, the, if I remember correctly, they're from the Ukraine. You got a female singer who's amazing at the growls. Oh, really? Yeah. She does like a lot of guest spots in other bands too. Hmm. And she did an amazing cover of Tattoos, um, all the things she said. Okay. She did an amazing cover of that. Well, wow. it's probably better than the original song. <laughs> cool. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't my question. Uh, Maldovan is another one that Deanna said. Maldovan? I don't know her then. Yeah, me neither. Uh, Great Dreads, uh, or Maldivan, maybe. Um, yeah, Omnium Gatherum was the one I wanted to tell yeah. you. Oh, yeah, there's, you that. there's a couple of bands I've found out, you know, through the years that I kind of knew ones that I, I do like. Uh, oh, you know, Ben, you probably like too? Anathema? You a fan of Anathema? Oh, Anathema, yeah, yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're, they're that, pretty that good. Song, Sleep, that song from them, Sleep, I think it's called. It's an amazing song. Credo Filth did a good cover of that song. Really? They covered them? Sleep. Wow. Yeah. It's a really good song, Sleep. Hmm. Uh, they, I think my favorite song by them is called uh, Unbreakable or something like that. It's uh, so good. Uh, I'll try to find it. But that un, I think it might be Unbreakable. Yeah, it's really good. But they're, they're quite a band. Um, what about Paradise Lost? I imagine you're a fan oh, of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that band's been, they, they, for like the late 90s, early 90s, they were pretty heavy influence on me too. Paradise mm -hmm. Lost. Especially the, uh, the album Draconian Times. Yeah, that was the one that really got me the most. Yeah. Uh, Draconian Times. That's some good songs. I can't tell you the names of them, but that whole album I was very familiar uh, to. The, la the Last Time's a great song. Yeah, the last time. Shadow Kings is probably like the best song on that album. And mm -hmm. I think it's like the very, very first song I ever heard from them was Shadow Kings. Oh, okay. And uh, kind of got to a few uh, folk metal bands from Russia lately too. I'm not oh, yeah. going to pronounce names because I don't know what their names in English are yet. <laughs> trying to mm -hmm. look them up. But it's been like one of them I think is called Kale Vala. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Kale that makes Vala, sense. Like that. They're, they're really good. Because hmm. the Kalevala is the uh, the Finnish folktale book that uh, Finn uh, Morpheus draws the lyrics from. So mm -hmm. I, you know, Finland and Russia share land, so maybe they have yeah. they share that uh, that folk history a little bit. Yeah. 
I mean, a lot um, of them, I don't think they're from Russia because some of them are from Ukraine. I know some of them get upset if you they're from Ukraine, you call them Russian. And so like, mm. yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, they don't like that. Yeah, <laughs> I know that. A lot of them, I won't say they're from Russia or, or Ukraine until I know their full history. <laughs> cool. So good, there's good, a lot of them. good move. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of, there's a lot of good metal coming out of Russia. Oh, that's cool. Deanna said that band she named uh, Maldovan. They're, they're Russian. They're a Russian band. Uh, Tom Skideri, what's going on? He says, happy Friday, John and Jason. Happy Friday. Yep, and it is Friday 13th, yeah. <laughs> which is, uh, and we're not talking about horror movies, but uh, um, I am uh, talking about Horror and metal goes. Yeah, hand. goes hand in hand, <laughs> that's true. And I, I did think it was cool that I'm hanging out with Jason on Friday 13th. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Uh, it's um, a perfect day. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, uh, I, another thing I posted not too long ago was uh, from Beauty and Chaos, Requiem, my high school, before oh, Beauty and Chaos yeah. band, a song called Friday the 13th. I don't know if you I think, heard, yeah, I think heard, I heard that. that. I, heard that. Yeah, I think I heard that song. You probably did, yeah. The Requiem title sounds familiar. At a, at a basement re rehearsal or something. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, Requiem was what we went by. <laughs> before beating chaos um yeah what was what was i gonna say oh yeah um paradise lost i did actually have this strange experience of seeing them in greece uh i went to visit my friend uh in, in greece and uh, just kind of to see the country i was and i was with justin and um our friend justin and uh we found out typo negative is going to play there while we're there. And, you know, we had a very strong connection to typo just from being in Brooklyn, but we also, I don't know if you know this, when we were, when I was in level six, uh, we rehearsed in uh, Rockaway Queens and um, typo negative was literally our next door neighbors. Like the, we walked out of our room and then the door next to it, which we could touch was typo negatives room. Oh, wow. So, well, they so used to do East London too. Yeah, right. So they yeah, like, I remember like rehearsing there with the, yeah. I remember rehearsing that I was actually using I think it was Pete Steele's hard key amp at the time because he used to leave it there and then when they were rehearsing and uh, he just walks in a room and like, oh shit, Pete Steele. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I have a memory of him at uh, Ace London too. Like the I think it was the day after or the day before we went to that Halloween show at Coney Island oh. High. There was a I went did a rehearsal at Ace London with uh it was still Beauty and Chaos, but it was becoming Clockwork, this trio I did with Justin and Joey. And uh, and then uh, this guy, Joe Bravo, who was running it, said, hey, there's a party tonight. Come back. So he came back. Pete Steele sitting at the front desk with a bottle of wine, just hanging, <laughs> you know, hanging out, joking around. Of course, I was 17, we're all kind of mesmerized, like, we love this guy's song, music. So we're, we're annoying him and hanging out with him. But he was cool. He, he gave... Uh, he gave Lou uh, 20 bucks to get home because uh, he thought, you know, he really didn't want him to, to take this long walk home late at night. Oh, wow. For a cab, you know? Oh, so, so cool. Yeah. So that was cool. Anyway, so then fast forward. So that was 98. Fast forward 2007. I'm in Greece and we had already done this uh, mini tour with Carnivore Level 6. So we went a small tour with Pete Steele and uh, so we knew we knew him pretty well, and uh, so they're playing this this baseball stadium in Greece that they had built for the Olympics, and they weren't using it for anything else because they don't play baseball in Greece. Uh, so they were, <laughs> they were just doing concerts there. So Justin got into his head like, "How about let's just try to let's try to get in for free?" I'm like, "What do you mean try to get in for free?" <laughs> so we just went there like with Greek mix between Greek culture, us being from Brooklyn, typos from Brooklyn. We, we said, you know, Hey, we know these guys, we're from Brooklyn. We're, we're with the band. Somehow we got in. Right. And then not only that, Justin's like, well, let's, let's go backstage too. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to do this. I just want to do it on the up and up, you know, I would pay yeah, yeah. Ticket, but he's like, yeah, let's do it. So I don't know. I think we just kind of psych someone out or for, we, we said, Hey, you know we're, we're on the guest list they, they forgot to put our names down but you know we're we're their friends <laughs> and we got backstage and we're walking around like these backstage halls of this baseball stadium and uh <laughs> then, then we see kenny you know the guitarist he's like he passes us like hey kenny he gives us a wave 
we then we saw Johnny. None of them were the least bit phased to see these guys who they've seen in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and mine just didn't comprehend that there was a connection there, but they knew our face, you know. And then finally, we get into um, the the room, the the green room with all of them. And then Pete's in the corner. He's hanging out with a couple of girls and uh, drinking wine. It was after the show, and uh, he we come over like, "Hey, Pete." He's like, "Oh." guy i don't know if he knew justin's name he didn't know my name but he called me the viking because i used to have this flying v with the norwegian flag on it and i had that uh, yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> he's like oh it's the viking <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like how you doing pete and basically he was saying don't be like me then he's like he, he gave us a lecture he's like uh yeah don't be like me i'm i'm uh whatever he was saying but he basically didn't have anything to say you know he was trying to joke around. That was his nature, but I guess he wasn't in a great mood. I don't think the band was in a great mood that day. Mm. Nobody cared that we were there in the least. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody thought it was weird. Like these guys from Brooklyn, they just show up to the Grease show, you yeah. know, or that we had backstage passes, you know, <laughs> which we didn't have, but we got backstage. But then we walked away from that show. I heard Paradise Lost Blessing in the background. That was a point. Sorry for this long winded thing. <laughs> 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 And we're walking away from this show and we weren't, I guess it was getting late. We weren't in the mood for any more. And uh, there's Paradise Lost rocking away and, you know, sounds great. And we go back. But I just remember feeling like I had already, the band had already broken up by that time. And I just felt like, yeah, I'm glad I'm not doing that. I just had the vibe. They didn't really want to be there. You yeah. know, I'm not to putting down typo or anyway. I think many no, no, bands yeah, go yeah. through this, you know. You just kind of get sick of the road, sick of each other, be a contractual obligations. You got to do these things. You don't want to be away from your family, but you have to be. And there was a lot of that going on. And I I sensed it, you know. I mean, you see it throughout the years. You saw Metallica go through that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I I have, you know, I have a son and a wife. And I think if I had to fight when I go away for two days, I, you know, it's a little bit hard. But if I had to go away for weeks and weeks at a time, yeah, that's, that's got to be rough. I wouldn't want to do that. And, and be with a bunch of smelly guys arguing over food and, mm-hmm. and money and, and, you know, just doing what guys do. Not like that's not cool, but uh, it's not exactly what I prefer. Sure, sure. It, uh, you know. It runs itself out eventually. Yeah, yeah it can get old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. But when bands can keep on going and seem to enjoy it, that's very impressive to me. They must be built yeah. just very uniquely, you know. Uh, uh, one, one quick funny story with a typo. I was at a horror convention where Wasp was performing. So Wasp was doing like an autograph signing. Pete Steele is there too, too doing an autograph signing. I think the Undertaker also, if I remember correctly. So I'm up there meeting Wasp. That's when they got their guitarist, Chris Holmes, back. That guy is, he's a nut job, right? And so like this really hot, beautiful goth woman is walking behind the table and she, um, Chris Holmes is like, oh, wow, look at her. I'm going to go talk to her. And like, you see that big dude over there pointing at Pete Steele. I'm like, that's his girlfriend. He's like, I'm not going to go talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. <laughs> that's just a funny little story. Yeah. From that. yeah no, I remember hearing some crazy stories about Pete and jealousy and girls and fist fights and, and even worse yeah. and jail time. So yeah, not to rehash any negative stories on his behalf, but I wouldn't mess around with his girlfriend. Yeah, you know, I thought he was a nice guy. I met him a few times and I used to work at GNC. He would come in. Yeah, King's Highway, right? Yeah. He's a good mm-hmm. dude. Yeah, yeah. He always said, I felt um whatever negative could be said about him, I, what I feel like he said himself is that like he he hated people equally. So yeah. he was very <laughs> equal opportunity <laughs> hater. He wasn't racist, he just hated everybody. Yeah, but him, he can, I remember him getting accused of that a lot. And I, I just be telling people, no, he hates everyone equally. <laughs> it's in his song. I hate everyone. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah, and he hated himself too. I mean, not to, that I'm psychoanalyzing him, but but you know, I got that vibe from him when I hung out with him that he just he included himself in that, you know, right in that hating people thing. And uh, but. But and anyone I've ever met who met him, and most most of us who are in the metal scene or music scene have had some encounter with him. And uh, pretty much everyone would agree, say what you said. He was a nice guy. He was, you know, pretty kind That's soul, true. funny, humorous, yeah. friendly. The first, time I, yeah, first time I saw him live, they were opening up for Danzig. And people were trying to, like, boo them off stage. 
Wow. I'm just, Shut up. I want to hear them. <laughs> it's like I want to see Typo more than Danzig. I like I liked Danzig a lot back then, but I really want to see Typo. But it was weird. Like I saw three bands live that got booed on stage and they were like the next big thing. Oh, really? What, like, what other bands? The other band I saw Limp Bizkit open up for Faith No More and they were getting booed. People even threw soda at their guitarist at that show. Wow. They were like the next big thing. And then the other one is uh, I saw Marilyn Manson open for, for Trent Reznor uh, for Nine Inch Nails at the Garden and people were booing Manson off stage too. Wow. <laughs> and, like, that must have been... Thing. Was that late 90s, I guess, when you saw Marilyn that was, Manson? That one was 95. If I remember. Ah, right. 95. I mean, maybe... Maybe 94, 95, around there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Um, I think we also went to, uh, I'm quite sure we went to see Iron Maiden together. Right? Yeah, with the PNC. The, yeah, PNC yeah, Band yeah. Center with uh, three guitars, right? That was like the point, it was brand new. Like now yeah, we're yeah. three guitars. Yep. And that was Bruce the first was time back. I saw them live with Bruce Dickinson because I saw them live before that with. Uh, it was Blaze Bailey Blaze was Bailey. the singer. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it, was, it was a weird show. It was at Roseland. It was them, Dio, and Wasp was supposed to play that show, but they canceled the last minute. Hmm. But wow. still went. So I got to see Dio and Iron Maiden. Was was Blaze Bailey a good performer? He will. Yeah, he was amazing live. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I mostly went for the show for Wasp, but they right. weren't there. I was like, oh, at least I still got Dio and right. Maiden. But I wasn't mm-hmm. expecting, because like, he sounds kind of weak on the albums, Blaze Bailey. Yeah, he does. But live, yeah. live, he sounded really strong. So oh, that's, like, good. that's I, good to know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I recently revisited The X Factor, the first Maiden album with Blaze Bailey. And uh, it strikes me as boring. You know, I, I want to like it. And I did like it at the time. It, it still sounds like Iron Maiden. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, it's just... Not, it's, like, it's hard to explain. Like to, to describe that album, it's like Maiden, but like, I don't know. I can't even. It's like yeah, not. It's hard. Yeah, I can't put it to words. Just it's made almost, not, yeah, almost like the heart's gone, kind of. Yeah. You know. Uh, to be honest, think, every album after that has been kind of like generic. Yeah. Right. Even when Bruce got back in the band, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just. It's like all right, just keep touring, but do your old stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. You have to fear the dark. Right? Yeah. Everything from fear the dark and down. Just keep doing that. Yeah, yeah. Even when they came out with Brave New World and stuff, I listened to it. But uh, actually, I prefer Bruce's solo stuff to any new Maiden. Some oh, of yeah. his solo stuff is pretty good. Like his uh, the song "Tears of a Dragon" he did. That was almost probably one of the most amazing songs ever written. <laughs> yeah, that was a good song. Cyclops, I think he did uh, around like, that time too. Yeah, that was the same. I think that was off of uh, "Balls of Picasso." Yeah, was the, the album. Um, I recently got into the album Skunk Works, which was late 90s or something by yeah. him. It's a good album straight through. Uh, <laughs> there's a, that other album with like uh, Seas of the Sun or something like that. It's 2004 or five, he came out with yeah, there was Tyr- one. Tyranny of Souls. That um, yeah, that was good. That's and good the album. other one, um, oh my god, it's like a red album cover. That was the name of it. That was really good too. Let's see if I can find it. Hmm. Can't remember if it's his last solo album or second to last. Oh, Accident of Birth. Oh, Accident of Birth. Mm-hmm. That was that was a great album. Okay, yeah, I'll check that out. Yeah, I uh, I realized I, I recently read Bruce Dickinson's um, uh, autobiography last year, maybe, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I, I was just kind of not as astonished, but surprised to, to know how much of a Bruce Dickinson fan I am with how much of my Iron Maiden fandom has to do with Bruce Dickinson. Oh, yeah. Lot, absolutely. Uh, almost 50%, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it I, just because if you switch them to another band, I still love that band, you know? Yeah. That's his vocals. His vocals are great. Yeah. And his attitude, or whatever it is, and he's Lyrics. like over He's still running back and forth on stage, jumping high. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I hope I could do that too. <laughs> that oh yeah, believe me. But, and and he's a pilot. Right. <laughs> he pilots. He pilots their plane when they go on tour. Mm-hmm. And he beat cancer like a few years ago too. Yeah, and he's a commercial pilot in between. Yeah, 
And he has a beer company or something like that. Yeah. I think yeah. they own the soccer team. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, quite a quite a legendary guy. Yeah. So I'm gonna go a little out of left field here. This might not be for you, but I'm just curious your opinion on it. Uh, and Mike Amari says I like I listen to a lot of Symphony X in college. Hey Mike Amari, thanks for joining. Good to What's see up, you here. And Deanna said her favorite Symphony X song is The Sacrifice. Um, I, mean, I heard a lot of Symphony X songs, but I don't remember. Like, I listened to them just to listen to them. I never really got heavily into them. Right. Yeah, same here. I know I respect it and appreciate it, but I don't know yeah. any names. So, out of left field, um, what, what is your feelings about Red Hot Chili Peppers? Uh, I mean, I respect them. They, mm. they write some pretty funky stuff, but they're not something I listen to on my own. Mm -hmm. Maybe Under yeah. the Bridge is probably like the only song I'll put on every so often, once in a while. Mm -hmm. Cause it's a nice, calming, relaxing song. Yeah. But that's really about it. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna, if it's at a party, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, I'll enjoy it. I'll listen mm -hmm. to it, I'll enjoy it. I'm not gonna be like, oh, who played this crap? <laughs> right. It's fun to listen to. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I asked that because uh, on my 2018 or something like that, the Spotify year in review, you ever get that? Do you listen to Spotify at all? No. Or use something? Okay. So Everything I, I do is Amazon Music. Amazon Music? Yeah. Okay. That thing, again, the last two years, that app has really gone good. Yeah, okay. They have a few suggestions. They tell you who's live on there speaking. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's gone a lot yeah. better. So I'm sure it's very similar to to Pandora. Uh, sorry, to Spotify. Yeah, they, they get they're getting there. Similar. Uh, anyway, so Spotify sends this year in review as a listener. I mean, it does as a creator too, but like if you're an artist on there. But um, as a listener, it said this is your most listened to music from this year, and uh, it's 2017, 2018. My num number one most listened to band was Red Hot Chili Peppers. Really? <laughs> and, uh, surprised me. And I was like, really? But do you, I, do you use Spotify often? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, definitely when I was jogging and when I was bike riding my bike, I put in one ear when I'm biking. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess it, it, for me, it's really good music to do something physical to. Right. And, and also, like, if I'm going to hang out in the backyard – and maybe the neighbors are around and my, my oh, yeah, yeah. family. It's, it's thing. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's a good middle ground because it, it really rocks. It's very like heavy in terms of like how much energy is in it, intensity. Yeah. It's not heavy in terms of distortion and stuff. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I feel I like... It, after, um, what's his name? Got into the band. Um, I can't remember. The guitar player. Prashanti? No, he does the tattoo shows now. Oh, uh, Dave Navarro? Yeah, Dave Navarro. They get, get their, their pace went up a little bit, right? Yeah, there's a little yeah. more distortion oriented yeah. at that point. Yeah, but uh, yeah, anyway, I, I, I'm a fan, and I'm, I have this this like group text going with some friends, and one guy always picks on me about how much RHCP sucks. And uh, no, I, no, I, suck, no. I, I don't bite the bait, <laughs> I don't take the bait, but uh, <laughs> he, he's got a, a chip on his shoulder, but I don't know why. But um, what's the thing about Red Hat Chili Peppers? You're like either love them or hate them and a few instances where me i just enjoy them when i can mm -hmm. i don't love them but i don't hate them either i far from hate them yeah yeah i guess i get i mean I, like i said i'm surprised i'm a, such a big fan but i am you know i, I thought i wasn't <laughs> <laughs> but apparently i listened to them a lot um so uh mike amari says dickinson is the heart of whatever act he's in i think that's oh, fair is. to say that is very very fair to say and uh, Deanna says, eh, RHCP used to be my favorite. Last two albums, not really. Okay. And Mike Amari, as a literature nerd, their album, The Odyssey, was always a favorite. Uh, who, whose album? Did our Chili Peppers had an album called Odyssey, or is this... Uh, it's Symphony not a Maiden X. album. Right. It's not Symphony X, I don't think. Oh, no. I Actually, I don't It could be Symphony X. It could be, yeah. Because I don't know their albums. But I don't think it's Chili Peppers album, is it? Um, all right. <laughs> and and uh, I think there's another live album, live experience we had together. I want to. Did you see Merciful Fate um, at Lemoore's? Oh, I never got the chance. I was supposed. I, 
I think I was supposed to go to that show and I can't remember why I couldn't go. Mm -hmm. If I remember that show coming around, I, I can't remember for the life of me why I had to miss it. Mm -hmm. What about uh, um, Megadeth Gigantor? If, if maybe I went with Jeremy or maybe I went with... I think you went with Jeremy. So... Oh, no, wait. When did I that was, it was Jones oh, Beach. Did you see Megadeth at Jones Beach? I think so. I think it was did me, you, and Jeremy going. Could have been. Because I remember going to a Megadeth show years. So the first time I saw them was in Roseland in '95. That was for the Youth in Asia tour. Wow. And then I didn't awesome. see them again until like over 10 years later. And I think it was like last minute. Hmm. At Jones, was, it, was it Jones? I think it was Jones Beach. And I just remember him like not sounding spot on that night. Yeah, I remember not being too impressed by that yeah. that show. Could have been the same one. I, or maybe I met you guys did, there. Did, did, Rob, did Rob Halford play that show too? I, did I remember, Rob Halford open for Iron Maiden at PNC? Yeah, Halford opened for Iron Maiden at PNC. Halford, Queensryche, Maiden. Yes, yes. And I remember Halford sounding amazing that night too. Yeah, yeah. I was, it was, I was and it was so him. Fun. It wasn't. I remember Fight was around that time, but it, it was Rob yeah. Halford that night, I think. And uh, I remember my ears were just so ringing from those yeah. three, three <laughs> guitars in Maiden. It was just brutally loud. Yeah, <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, I wonder if some of my hearing loss is from that or uh, just from oh, like sure. all this, all the, all the electromagnetic frequencies of Bluetooth and all this technology in the air. Who knows? At this point, it would be hard yeah. to pinpoint it now. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so uh how would you describe your philosophy on life oh i think it's ever it's ever changing you yeah. know what i mean especially um especially after getting into viking metal a lot of it is just just whatever you do just keep going forward just go just go <laughs> don't look back you're not going that direction stuff like that mm -hmm. you know you know for philosophy too bruce lee's always been an important influence on me especially his whole quote on water be like water. You ever heard that mm -hmm. quote? Maybe, but I don't remember it. Yeah, it's basically water, whatever it needs to be, it needs to be to get going. And it'll destroy, eventually destroy any obstacle in its way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, oh, I, I like that. Yeah. Like whatever, whatever you have to do, just do it. Be what you have to be when you have to be it. And especially this place I train at now, one of their philosophies too is like for self defense, is you have to turn off that that non-animal instinct in you to survive. Just be, be what you need to become. You don't need any more than 30 seconds to do it. Mm -hmm. You'll survive almost any situation, almost any situation. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's kind of like the same as the be like water quote from Bruce Lee. Right, just like kind of, kind of be the, whatever the element of the environment yeah. is calling you to be yeah because so he'll, he'll finish the quote off saying when you put water into a cup it becomes a cup the shape of the cup when you put water into a pot it becomes that pot mm -hmm. so, so be what you need to be in any situation to get it done to do what you have to do cool yeah no, I, I, I didn't know that quote f was from him or actually i never heard it in that put in that way actually mm -hmm. pretty cool uh, it reminds me of two things in in Buddhism, which I'm practicing for about 12 years now. Yeah. There's a quote. There's a quote which is, um, uh, it's, uh, and it's not exactly a quote, but a concept, which is to have faith like water, not like fire. So fire like flares up quickly and then burns out. Right. And <laughs> water just be consistent and cool, not to like get over excited, but this like cool, clear and just steady flow of faith throughout your life. So that right. you're, like, you're just constantly showing up, doing what you need to do. You're, uh, you know, bringing your best self to the table, but it's not overly flashy. It's not overly passionate right. and then fading away. Yeah. And becoming flaky. It's just this steady presence. Yeah, because it's like the, it's like the idea of like water will eventually erode rock, get it out of mm -hmm. the way, but it doesn't do it in a flashy way. It just, you know. And it goes about water doesn't stop it just keeps going even yeah. if it hits something it'll keep hitting it until it erodes mm -hmm. so it's, it's the same, right. same idea of like bruce lee's quote too maybe he was even inspired by mm -hmm. that buddhist quote <laughs> right yeah who knows could be 
I, I remember uh, in the book Siddhartha, which was written by um, Herman Hess. Siddhartha is the historical Buddha figure, but mm -hmm. uh, Herm, this guy, this German author, Herman Hess, wrote a book about the historical narrative and made it kind of made a bit his own. And I think it was in that book or the movie Siddhartha where he. Uh, the Buddha is looking into the water. He becomes this, uh, you know, first his journey, he's like, uh, he's born like a rich son of a king. And then he decides he wants to like leave the nest. And then he, he tries to become an ascetic, or like going for long periods without eating, meditating in the forest. He says, that's not it. Then he goes and like indulges his senses and pleasures business, be becomes rich, uh, gets involved with women that's not it then he decides to follow the middle path and he becomes this uh um boat boat uh he, he uh boat driver what do you call it boat <laughs> pilot that takes people from one side of the shore to the other and then from that side of the shore and back that's his job and that's what he ultimately ends up doing in like a ferryman yeah ferryman yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah and then so at that point he he explains while his passengers are crossing the water, like he'll teach them about Buddhism. And this is like the beginning of Buddhism. And he'll explain that the river is never the same river twice. And as you look at the water and, and he would teach that. And I always think about that when I look at a river, I'm like, this is never the same river for even one split second into the next. It's always a new river. Yeah. The water is always a different water. Even if it had gone through the cycle in the past, whatever, 10 years or hundred years, it's always a different combination of water molecules flowing by at any second, you know, right. and that's how our life is mm -hmm. constantly fresh and new, even if it looks similar. Right. Right. Know, it's, it's always brand new. All right. That's, that's cool. Cool concept. I like that. Yeah. So what aspect of your, let's see if oh, Mike Amari says uh, captain or farrier. Yes. Thanks Mike for uh, <laughs> chiming in. And, uh, uh, Deanna says I'm Hindu, similar to John Henry. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure how similar Hindu and Buddhism is, but that's a good dialogue we could have one day, Deanna. <laughs> yeah, it was explained um, to me once a long time ago, and I can't really remember. Yeah, I mean, I, I have my experiences. I could formulate it. I, I did visit India for a couple of weeks, and uh, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's all it's all learning. Everything is an opportunity to learn. Um, oh, yeah. Mike says that uh, he prefers Amazon Music, Spotify. He uses for podcasts. All right, uh, and uh, My Amazon's podcast section is getting better. Right, that, that's relatively new. I never listened to podcasts on there yet. I always use the the Apple one for podcasts, but oh, okay. Uh, but I haven't listened to podcasts in about two years because I was using it when I go to work, or and I haven't been yeah. commuting. <laughs> for a while so uh anyway um what aspect of your life philosophy helps you to recover from setbacks because i imagine there's you know you've you're a positive guy you know you got a good spirit so i imagine there's been some setbacks along the way but somehow you keep moving forward i just always remind myself it could just be could, could always be worse mm -hmm. there's always worse out there no matter what you're going through, someone's feeling even worse than what you are. Yeah. Right. Just that uh, perspective, right? Yeah. It took me a long time to get that perspective. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> mm -hmm. it's there. <laughs> yeah. That, that like appreciation for, hey, I have my own share of trials and tribulations, but I know others that have a lot I mean, more in their plan. Yeah. yeah. And maybe much much more who knows right oh, yeah. um yeah cool and uh so how has your music uh your tastes in music shifted over the years hmm. well it's like to bring back that band of 80 sounding mm -hmm. like i said i never knew music it sounds so organic versus the synthesizer that that's like a huge factor for me now it's probably why i listen to like a lot of the folk metal bands now and a lot of them coming out of russia and the ukraine are just as amazing with that 
some of them do the heavy stuff with it. Some of them is just straight up with the folk sound. Yeah. Um, I don't know, to me, that's just, I don't know, gets into my brain better. I, mean, yeah. I still listen to like Megadeth and Metallica. That's like purely for nostalgic reasons. It reminds me of a time, you know, I'm younger and mm -hmm. so many more possibilities to life. Mm. But I kind of feel like the folk metal just keeps me grounded and like in the moment. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I totally get it. Yeah. Now, yeah, when I think about it, a lot of the music, a lot of times when I listen to some of the older, my older favorite bands like Metallica, Megadeth, it is for that nostalgic pleasure. Because um, in the moment, I'm not, I tend not to be enjoying it as much as I used to. Right. But then I'll, then I'll change it. Uh, I did listen all the way through Injustice for All the Song when I was jogging maybe two days ago. It was a little hard to get through the whole thing. It's like a nine minute song. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's just the sound was so good. I'm just, I challenged myself. I'm like, can I have the patience to listen to it? It was good, but yeah, the nostalgia helped a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, if it wasn't there, I don't know. I'd probably prefer something else. I mean, it also makes you feel younger inside too. So like maybe you did that extra mile while you were jogging, listening to it. Yeah, yeah. right. Or went a little faster, you know. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, like cool, sometimes yeah. I'll, I go to kickbox, sometimes I'll listen to Master Puppets and I'll get me like ready to go. Mm -hmm. And right, right after that listen to like a viking metal song mm -hmm. to hype me up <laughs> and do you have a come down song something to kind of slow you down uh, or, yeah it usually be uh, like something, like maybe um like a score from a movie or something like that okay that's cool i can see that um mike says uh yeah you've been great at opening me up to the folk metal stuff i first heard mongolian throat singing because of you jay oh the who yeah h-u yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and nostalgia and music have always been inextricably linked that's for sure that's for sure oh yeah yeah like like you were saying your parents listening to the oldie station in the car right and that's like when, when those songs pop up and i just instantly go back to being a kid sitting in the back seat mm -hmm. uh, going to like i don't know to the movies or to, to on the to upstate where we used to stay in the pocono sometimes mm -hmm. like long drives like that yeah, it's amazing. That's part of the power of music that it just transports us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When I'm when I've been writing in my book and trying to come up with, like, let's say years that are hard to remember, uh, music is such a key figure. So I, I go through every year and think of all the what are all the, the pop songs that I, and I see? What can I relate to? And I write down then what, what can I remember being into? And when I start isolating which music came out in what year? If I listen to that music, or if I just think about how I felt, I could create a paragraph or two or three, and then all of a sudden I'm writing about that year. Like if I, if you write about the first time you heard Enter Sandman, right, or if you talk about it, you're gonna come up. There's gonna be quite a bit to say, probably, yeah, because you remember that, yeah. uh, and that that'll take you back to 1991. You all of a sudden you're talking about 1991, yeah, you know. So it is this this portal. Um, which I, yeah, I really enjoy entering. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially if it's a good year. My yeah. Francis Sandman, I was eighth grade at the time. I think it was eighth grade. Yeah. I just, I hated middle school. And so that <laughs> last year middle school was just one of right. my most years. I do not ever want to visit again, <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah, listening to the Enter Sandman will remind me of that, but Right. It makes me also grateful for better times. Yeah, right. It's, it's all, you know, we got to take, we got to take it all together, right? It's all one big, uh, big puzzle that right. we're in our life, you know? You're never done with, you're never done with. Yeah, right. That, that's never actually finished. Yeah. Uh, Mike says, uh, Mike Mari says, it's so primal <clears throat> music. It just lights up our brains and helps us make connections. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's a middle school teacher himself, and he says everyone hates middle school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we both work in the same school. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, he's a teacher. I'm not. So he gets he gets the worst of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. Uh, yeah, I was in Catholic school, middle school, so it wasn't didn't feel middle so much because it was the same school as grade school. But 
um, that those years I didn't yeah. quite awkward. I didn't like them too much. Um, Oliver Sacks book music musical philia. I don't know. I, I never read that. Have you heard of it? Music music no. philia. All right. I'll keep keep my mind open to that, Deanna. Thank you. Um, so so let me see. I got a few more questions for you. You got you good on time? A few more minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so all right. So uh, do you have a? I, th I think we kind of discussed this. Um, do you have a spiritual philosophy that guides or informs what you do and how you live? Uh, spiritual? Uh, I mean, maybe I do and didn't realize it's spiritual. I'd have to think about that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, uh, I guess one is when I, uh, when I started also training in kickboxing, there was a, I can't remember who said it, but it's, um, the quote is, uh, I don't lose. I either win or I learn. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to make that like uh, whatever goes bad for me, I try to learn from it now, all the time. Yeah, um, that, that's that, that. I mean, that that basically sounds like Buddhism to me. That that concept. Uh, I, either I'm sure win, so many different win, cultures right. have had it too. Yeah, oh, like, yeah. like the whole like the, a lot of warrior cultures they have that keep moving forward. Like a lot, some reason like Vikings get credited for that a lot, but I'm pretty sure there are plenty of warrior cultures throughout time who have had a similar philosophy. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to go home, that's the way home, not that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. I like <laughs> so I'm that. I'm pretty sure there's uh, many, many cultures. They just word it differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, there's a, there's this, there's this daily guidance mm -hmm. book, uh, a Buddhist daily guidance book I was using for many years. Like every day I would read, it's called for today and tomorrow. And I would read, the guidance for today and i read the guidance for tomorrow to prepare me but you don't read yesterday's guidance <laughs> that's kind of the thing you read today yeah. and tomorrow that's and the good next day you read today and tomorrow you don't go back and read of course you can and benefit from that but the well, concept yeah. is you just you know you read today and tomorrow and that's what you focus on today and tomorrow yeah it's kind of similar to the don't look back you're not going that way yeah philosophy. Mm -hmm. yeah there's so many different cultures have that you just word it differently right and and I, I I totally on a personal level I feel like um, there's no point in looking back if uh, if it kind of hinders me in any way, uh, but I do enjoy looking back. So if I enjoy it, you know, and sometimes it's painful, of course, but I, I also have this element of like you know you hear these ideas like learn from the past or so we don't oh, yeah. repeat the mistakes like like World War II Nazis or whatever. right right. But I think the whole don't look back thing is don't wish you were still there because it's already gone. Stop trying to wish things were the same, accept the new and just keep moving forward. I think that's what it means the most. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you look back to learn from it, but now don't wish you were there. Yeah, yeah, I totally feel that and relate to it. Because it, it, the, when, because if you think about it, um, just to add on to that, when, when that time was, it was the present, right? It wasn't right. the past. So if, if you were to have enjoyed that time, you were enjoying the present. So keep enjoying the present would be the right. most similar way to, to enjoy that previous time. But to try exactly. to reenact the past, it's a totally different thing. You <laughs> miss the boat, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's tricky. It, we, it takes time to learn that sometimes. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you meditate at all or have some sort of a kind of way no. to become mindful? I can say like kickboxing every night, that, that helps me. Oh, yeah, every night yeah oh wow well, yeah so i've increased this this past two weeks i've increased my time to two hours every night now and wow. i did an hour this afternoon <laughs> and so i'm gonna do an hour tomorrow morning wow you know, yeah this is I, great no matter how bad the day is i just go there and i just punch it out by the time i leave i'm all relaxed i'm calm like i said working with middle school kids can really uh yeah have you bonkers. <laughs> i bet not just them working in this in the in the school system, mm -hmm. also drive you pretty mad. Yeah. Oh man, I can imagine. <laughs> I, I had my taste of it, so <clears throat> so I can relate. Oh, so you know, if Mr. Mari's yeah. still there. Oh, Michael mm -hmm. Mari, not Mr. Mari. I used to call him that all day at work. <laughs> <laughs> in front of the kids. Yeah. Right. So knows. Mike said. Uh, Mike Mari said that um, one of the reasons he chose to work in middle school was because he remembered 
how sucky it was. And he says if if there was only some good decent teachers, it would have made it better. So he thought yeah, there were no decent. I did, I, need. Yeah, I can't remember any positive teacher I had in, in middle school. <laughs> like all, all the teachers that I remember came from high school, not from uh, mm-hmm. not from middle school. I basically feel the same, except that I, there's one guy who, I don't know if he was a good teacher, but he did instill in me, he probably was pretty decent, the practice of keeping a journal, which has been really invaluable to me. So yeah, that's something I always kind of meant to start doing, and it just keeps slipping my mind. I just, mm-hmm. but I, I just, I'll do it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, some people who wasn't... Uh, yeah, so, you know, whenever you start, you start, you know, and from that right. point on, you have this, this record. Uh, I did actually throw away journals from a couple of years, uh, like a window of time where they were just dark and hard for me to look at. And for me to move on and grow, I, I just felt it was better. And I like ripped them up. I went through this process um, some years it ago. Made, made you feel better too, right? Yeah, it, it's kind of like, you know, you burn, burn it, that type of thing. I didn't actually burn it, but... Um, letting go of the past because all the stories that were connected to it, I just preferred not to remember. Of course, I did keep many journals, but a lot I did get rid of maybe like a a bag's worth. And, uh, you know, when I go to write those about those years in my autobiography, I'm a little sad sometimes like, ah, fuck man, there's so much that I had written that I could draw from, but I realize now because I don't remember those time periods so much without the journals i have to look at the you have to use photos and then i have to use my other methods which is like what songs came out that year what albums what movies what tv shows i do have this whole method and then the most important thing is i have to reach out to friends and say hey do you remember that that concert we went to what was it you know and then then it makes me reach out to human beings who were the whole reason that my life was special is all the relationships in it, you know? Right. Right. So I'm, I'm glad I let go of those journals because it, my lack of memory about things forces me to reach out to friends from those eras, which is really a good thing, you know? Yeah. And reconnect with people that you haven't <clears throat> for a while. It's yeah. Great. It's, it's, and, and it's cool. Cause then, and one thing I'm always learning as I write my story is that there. <clears throat> I, I feel, and I'm not saying this is correct, but I, I kind of believe that there is no truth. Um, I mean, you could say this is the one higher truth, but that we can't access it because there's my truth, there's your truth. And you, you might've heard, I might've heard, there's my truth, your truth, and the truth. <clears throat> but I don't know what the truth is, right? So I don't think anyone knows because whenever you, we speak it, it's, it's going to be my truth or me right. trying to explain something else but if it's not my truth, then it, then what is it? You know? So yeah. I, I could speak my truth. You could speak your truth. We could guess what one another is thinking or someone else. But so I, as, as a, you know, this comes clear when I start writing about a story and I say, Hey, uh, you know, let's say even with your brother, cause we were in bands together. Hey, Jeremy, what do you remember about this time? And he'll tell the story. I'm like, okay, about 75% <laughs> is what I remember. <laughs> I, rem- I remember this yeah, other yeah. stuff. And then I asked Dave, Dave, what do you remember? And then we're going even more different direction. <laughs> and then that happens with family all the time, right? Like I say, hey, mom, remember in 1992 when this happened? She's like, that didn't happen. You said, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, really? I, my yeah, whole like yeah. personality is based on thinking that that happened, you know? <laughs> These things oh, yeah, look like crazy. Yeah. You know? So I, I really, when I write my book, I'm going to put in the preface or whatever that this is not true, but this is my truth. Right, as right. best I could say, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I think in terms like that, yeah, that, that does work out. But I think there are some areas where the truth is the truth and stuff like that. But if, like really for smaller things that happen in life, nothing for like bigger stuff, because who knows like what the truth really is. Yeah, point. yeah, I mean, I, I would, I mean, I certainly believe in, uh, what I would term the mystic law, but it could be seen as um, higher power or uh, so let's say cosmic justice or universal justice, you know, like mm-hmm. things will, justice will be had on a universal, on a cosmic level. If it doesn't look like it for a while, 
on the earth plane on the bigger scale you know people sort of reap what they sow if you want you know right um so in that sense i believe there is truth that like if i do if i plant a bad seed i'm going to get a bad plant if i plant a good seed i'm going to get a good plant right that concept uh so yeah i i, I you know i guess I, what i was just saying is that uh, i don't feel that the truth is something that uh, can be easily identified in words you know right so, but we could try to, to, to yeah it's to the individual right which yeah. then comes back to my truth your truth you know yeah and just respecting that hey you have your truth i know it's your truth i have my <laughs> truth i know it's my truth it's the best as i could do you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh but part of my truth is respecting that everyone else has their own truth that might that is likely going to differ from mine to some extent and that's fine you know right I don't know. Anyway, that, that is the philosophical point of the podcast. So this is getting real yeah, interesting, like, guys. <laughs> philosophy is not my strong suit. <laughs> ah, you're, you're, hang, you're hanging in really well. Um, Mike Amari said, uh, reflect, learn, and move forward. A loss is not a loss if you learn from it, like, like you were saying before. Yeah, yeah. And Lisa Markwitz Tro says, hope you guys are having a great summer. Yes, you too, right. Lisa. And uh, Deanna also said that the book Music File, if I'm saying right, is about effects of music on the brain. It's good to know. And then uh, Mike yeah. says, Mike says like Rashimon. You know what that is? Rashimon? No. Rashimon? I'm not sure what that is, Mike. Uh, all right. I mean, the idea of music like affecting like the brain or, and emotions and stuff like that is, I, I, I think it's true. I think it's true for a lot, a lot of people. Because I remember there's a cartoon growing up. Well, here it's called Robotech. In Japan, it's called Macross. And it's about, you know, aliens come, invade. There's a war race of aliens. And humans are trying to figure out what the secret weapon is that humans are supposed to use in the time. And the cartoon is called Protoculture. They don't know what the hell Protoculture is. But it turns out to be human emotion. And mm -hmm. what's the best way to, to send out human emotion is through music. Mm -hmm. So then like when these aliens come and they start hearing music and interacting with the human way of life, they start to change. And so that's supposed to be, it's, it's real cheesy, but I think at an early age for me that implanted the importance of music for me. And I didn't realize it until I got older, mm -hmm. how important music is and what it can do. And the, just the, the power of music. Oh yeah, man. I think even you could definitely, say there's a certain amount of uh brainwashing through music not to go down a rabbit hole of um what's the word uh conspiracy theory but i don't even think it's the conspiracy theory my feeling is that a lot of pop music <clears throat> is designed to to dumb down the masses really oh um, yeah I, I believe in that too i mean that's why if, if you take like I'm, i don't want to bash other people's favorite music styles i don't really do that i just there is a degree of talent in certain music styles. Like if you take, like say, Fleur Jensen, who sings in Nightwish, who trained for years and years and years in various styles versus someone like Beyonce, who makes millions more than she does, but didn't go anywhere near as much training vocally as Fleur Jensen has. Mm -hmm. Like, but um, but more people listen to the simpler side than, pe than listen to the slightly more complicated side. I mean, that's why like, Bands like Nirvana and Green Day were more popular than, say, Dream Theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they, designed to be that simple and just catch your attention, especially the attention of the masses, which who really aren't. Most of them aren't musicians or appreciate how, how vast, like a uh, the vastness of what music can be. Right. Most, I say, the average listener probably experiences music on a. Uh... <laughs> more shallow level, right? Than, than uh, right. someone who's really deeply into music. Yeah. <clears throat> like, like say, yeah, Green Day was like a three piece band, one guitar player who also sang bass player drums, not much going on there. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember like the first two weeks of like uh, learning how to play guitar, I was able to play like a few songs off Nevermind. Mm -hmm. right. I guess only like two, three weeks of guitar lessons. <laughs> yeah. And so, which, is, but... <clears throat> which is part of what made, uh, which is, part of why Nirvana is so amazing and Green Day would kind of be similar right. in that boat in terms of learning songs easily. Um, 
And Ramones, yes. Ramones is like a band that's been massive and they only use three chords their entire career. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> True. And they're yeah. still huge. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I see, I don't know if you're listening to pop music today over the last 10 years. Um, probably like accidentally you hear it maybe, but uh, I, I imagine you don't choose the top 40 uh, of 2019 <laughs> or something. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But uh, I have as a teacher, because there were some things I was teaching and trying to teach the past decade. It's toxic, man. I, I want to, uh, I want to curse as I'm saying, but I, a lot of it's very toxic garbage. And what I mean by that is like really just promoting sex on a whole new level. Oh yeah. Yeah. That whole, that the whole era pop with like Cardi B and Nicki Minaj and yeah. And, and without yeah. having musical like value, like, Music right. always had that sexual element, but it, the music value has been dumbed down. The sexual part has been uplifted, or violence, oh, yeah, or, yeah. or like showing off, or bling, or you know, and it's just like to the point of like scary because you really young impressionable minds are being putting the, they're putting it in front of their face. Oh, yeah, yeah. or it's like there's no meaning to life. Yeah. Kind of yeah. similar to glam rock in the '80s, where everything was about partying and doing drugs, and that's what a lot of youth did back then. Because that's what okay. that music was designed to inspire. Right. I, I, I definitely agree with that. But I would add that the 80s music tended to have something really uh, just genuinely fun about it. You know, like, yeah, there's this like it's, then there's this artistic element. If it sucked, people wouldn't like it you know, generally. But but uh, if it was good, then all the shallow stuff could be in there. And that was part of it. But now yeah, it's like they, the between like Poison and Motley Crue, right? Like Poison was that. To purpose was to sell millions of records and like motley crew was too but like motley crew was more of like that stage show like where they purposely made themselves look like they were more than what they were like, mm -hmm. like they really went into like the sex drugs and rock and roll for the stage but right. poison was more of like that, that that glam just to be big but they weren't i don't know if poison really promoted the whole sex drugs and rock and roll really i think they were promoting the good times more and Molly Crew was just promoting the absurdity of it more. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Well, anyway, on any level, um, <laughs> you, I do agree that that stuff is toxic too to young minds when it's just right. like about really, uh, what's the word, like existentialism. Let's just live for today and party and pleasure and not really right. worry about what kind of seeds we're planting or actions if we're going to influence people in negative way so like deanna says sexual explicit messages that children don't need to hear exploiting oh, yeah. women and she says 90 percent of today's music is garbage yeah, i would say you know unfortunately uh, on, on that's available to the masses i'd say yes um or that's like a, that's fed to the masses i would say yes but spotify also and any of those music platforms have all the indie music music like myself like many many others i can name that no one has ever heard of just because we're people that that live at home or that that create music or you know maybe some people tour maybe some people do uh local gigs or something but they constantly create and put out music so a lot of that stuff i would say is not in that 90 percent of garbage yeah but, uh, what's what's available to the masses through uh, i guess basically major labels or anything that's being pushed with a lot of money is primarily garbage. Well, yeah, I think there are some indie indie artists that are pushing against that. Like, um, I don't know if I should bring this guy up because he's very controversial. Tom McDonald, he's a indie rapper. He has no record label backing him, and his whole thing is just about, you know, pointing out everything that's wrong with today mm -hmm. and music like that. And he has one song where he uh, he basically says like he can't he can't believe the world looks at him as controversial, but was it Cardi B is the role model for 12 year old girls right, like yeah. stuff like that. He just doesn't, he will bring out in his music. Mm -hmm. he's, he's like you said, he's very controversial. And, but uh, he's controversial because he just speaks the truth a lot. He just says what everyone's thinking, but is too afraid to say out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just yeah. Hated. yeah. And sometimes, uh, sometimes that sometimes that's necessary or, or mm -hmm. helpful, you know? Yeah. Um, so, Jason, can you uh, share up to three inspiring books, films, or shows, or maybe albums, if that, whatever comes to you is like, this is an inspiring thing. 
that you want to share with people? Let's say people are a little worn out from the two years of or year and a half pandemic. What 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 helped you get through, or what do you think might inspire other people to share? Uh, let's see. Oh, for music, like I said, I listen to a lot of Elevati. Um, I would listen to live shows too, like live albums, like Live After Death, Mario Maiden, which is probably like the greatest live album <laughs> ever recorded. <laughs> because, you know, especially missing going to concerts and stuff like that, that gave you like a sense of being there. Because especially mm -hmm. that album, it's, it's very well balanced between hearing the band and, and hearing the audience. Like not too many live albums are like that. Yeah, that, that's quite a good one. And I just, you know, for movies, and I just tried to watch the dumbest comedies I could <laughs> to keep me laughing. Or I'd watch like my favorite horror movie of all time, which is Evil Dead. I'd watch that quick. <laughs> and and that to, to lift your spirits, right? Yeah. Which is funny. I, I get it. I think some people wouldn't get that, but. No, they would uh... not get that. <laughs> They're like, they would just look at you weird. Like, you, you just got to watch it. And, and if you don't see it, you don't see it. If you do, right. you do. Does it make yeah. me better or you better or worse? <laughs> so you just get it or you don't get it. Yeah. That's a horror movie that just kind of like one of the only few horror movies that actually pulls you in completely. And like you forget sometimes you're watching a movie. Like you're just so entrenched in this. Mm -hmm. but yeah. I may do that. <laughs> one of the very few horror movies or movies that, uh, that where the sequel is just a remake of the first one, right? <laughs> Isn't that kind of Yeah, true? it's like a, it's like a, yeah, it's, I've got the term of it. There's like a, a, a phrase for it. I can't remember it. Let's say it, let's remake and sequel. But I mean, Evil Dead 2 is great, but it didn't do as good of a job of bringing you in because it is so absurd of a movie that you you still know you're watching a movie mm -hmm. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Evil Dead 1 is smaller, you know, lesser, less cast in the movie. Right. You know, it's, it's, more creativity, yeah, it's, right? Yeah. It feels anyway. more calm in the beginning, like you're just watching like this movie of a group of friends getting away from the world. Mm -hmm. And oh look, they find a book made of human flesh and written in blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> yeah, quite. Yeah, I never experienced anything like that. It, there's really nothing you can compare it to, right? Yeah. It's 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 not like a slasher. It's not really like yeah. a zombie movie. You know, even though it's, it's yeah, it, it gets it gets categorized as a zombie movie a lot, which pisses me off. I, I would guess that would be the closest thing, but yeah. it doesn't feel like it's not, that. Zombie. It's I would say it's more of a, a demon possession movie because mm -hmm. everyone has to get possessed first to become a deadite. They're not like they're not mindless zombies. Mm -hmm. They can think, they can respond to you, they can laugh at you. Okay. Or you. So a little bit like uh, Night of the Demons. If you remember that movie? Yeah, more like Night of the Demons. Mm -hmm. But it always gets categorized as zombie. Yeah, I could see that why that would happen. But uh, yeah. Well, if you never watched like it, if you've seen like clips of it, you would think so. Yeah. But mm -hmm. no, like I remember, I have one friend. She was just like, oh, "I'm not watching it. It's a zombie movie." I'm like it's not a zombie movie. <laughs> but I played her a clip from the remake, and she was like, "All right, it's not a zombie movie." <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and were you a big fan of Army of Darkness when that came out? Yeah, it was weird because like I didn't know Army of Darkness. I didn't realize Army of Darkness was a sequel to Evil Dead One and Two because I didn't get to see mm -hmm. it in theaters when it was out. I just remember like when the trailer came on, see, I'm like, this guy looks familiar. Like chainsaw hand, the blue shirt, <laughs> it looks so familiar. And then I um, I finally got it on on VHS when it came finally came out for home. I'm watching it. I'm like, holy crap, this is Evil Dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, no, yeah, because I, I was I was still a kid at the time when Army of Darkness was coming out. Right. <laughs> yeah, so it's like I didn't put two and two together right away. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I don't think they made it clear. So yeah, when me too, yeah, I, yeah. I discovered it. I realized there was a sequel to Evil Dead when I watched them. Like, yeah, oh cool. Because yeah, originally the movie poster was created for it, but they never released. It was Evil Dead Three and the Army of Darkness was supposed to be the title, or uh, something mm -hmm. line, and they just went with Army of Darkness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I was like, oh, because I remember putting it on. It's like they, they showed the end of Evil Dead Two. I'm like, this is Evil Dead Two. <laughs> like that's why he looked familiar in the trailer. Cool, cool. Um, any uh, TV shows or something that that you that you've uh, found pretty entertaining recently? Uh, I mean, 
like just something I just got into or I just watch over and over again to either one anything like well for me I would say uh, Twilight Zone is something that's uplifting that I return to again and again like the original right yeah 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 oh uh, yeah I, I like to go back and watch like the, um, Martin that was like one of my favorite shows oh yeah that, that always keeps me laughing uh the Wayne's Brothers show I always like that always kept me laughing really? I watched a lot of those during the pandemic too so Martin, um, the Wayne's Brothers shows. Yeah, those are those are great. Uh, what else? That was a lot. Cool. Yeah, now I got a whole lot of stuff to put in the show notes. Um, <laughs> you ever see the movie Transylvania Six Five Thousand? No, I've heard of it. I just haven't gotten to, down to actually watching it. It's it's on Amazon Prime right now for free. Um, I I just. I remember it from when I was younger and I just start re started rewatching it and it's got Jeff Goldblum, uh, Ed Begley Jr. Davis, right? Sorry? Dina Davis in that one too? Yeah, yeah, she's in yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've seen clips of it here and there throughout the years, but I've never actually sat down and watched the whole movie straight through. It's fun. It's goofy. Kind of like yeah. a young Frankenstein. What's the Frankenstein with uh, Gene, Gene Wilder? It's a little oh, yeah, bit yeah. that yeah. that mood type of thing, very playful, and it takes place in Transylvania. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the eighties. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always looked like a fun movie. I just have to watch it straight through. Like I've seen like bits of the beginning, the middle. I've never seen the ending, so I don't know <laughs> how it ends. But I mean, I'm yeah. gonna sit down and watch it. <laughs> I'll probably do it for like October. Mm-hmm. Like I like every night of October, I like to watch a horror movie I've never seen before or a horror That's time. <laughs> That way, by the end of the year, I have 31 new movies I've never seen yeah. <laughs> nice. that, I, that I finally seen. <laughs> and how do you do that? Mainly through Netflix or, or what? Yeah, through Netflix. And like, like if I see a horror movie on sale through Voodoo that I know it's on any other platform, I'll buy it and I'll save it for October. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, cool. Right now, I'm, I'm trying to go through my list. I'm preparing my list right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I do you remember I were you a part of it? Um I had I had the horror movie Heltastic Meltdowns uh, in my house around Halloween. Uh yeah, I think, I think I went days. to I think I went to one or two. Yeah, I right, imagine exactly. you would certainly have been invited. I, th- I think did we I think one of them we watched Jaws. Or maybe sounds, Jaws 3D to make fun of it or something. Very I sounds think, very possible. <laughs> I think it was like a Jaws 3D thing and then a Friday the thirteenth three three D. Oh, okay. You, you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, sounds sounds good to me. Something along the line of that. Yeah, I remember there was candy, probably yeah. coffee, probably uh, soda. It's <laughs> just a lot of oh, yeah, back, stuff to keep you. Well, you could eat all that stuff and feel fine the next day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, yeah, anyway, I was just wondering. Yeah, no, I think I, my goal was always to do like nine hours of horror movies. I think that was the thing. Which is not that many, um, you know, four or five, but it, it but it's very tough to get, get a group of friends to sit down and actually watch it. Oh, I always yeah. just turn into a hangout session and with that on the well, back. Sometimes you have people in and out throughout the day. Yeah, yeah. But, well, it was fun to try. Oh, I wish I could do that stuff again. That was, that was, that was a fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Mike says, um, Mike Amari says, me and Tara are watching Friday the 13th 3D right now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Actually, just uh, on Voodoo, they had the, so the first eight movies on sale for $13. So I just bought it. So oh, I have wow. one on, on Blu ray. I just don't oh, yeah. figure for 13 bucks, all eight films. The first eight, not all of the Friday 13, just the first eight films. Mm-hmm. I guess the ones that were under um, New Line or whatever, whoever owned it before them. Yeah, those, I mean, those are the, the classic set, right? Yeah. To scene. me, six, six is the best. Six? Friday the 13th, six. That was, that was so, that, that one was so 80s. Oh, so 80s. And that was, it was like Canadian, was it filmed in Canada or the main guy was Canadian, I think? Tommy? Was yeah, that, yeah, the guy who, yeah, that, that guy was, uh, I think he was the, was Canadian. The guy who played Jason, the, uh, the guy who played Jason was Canadian, I think, right? I know. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about like the main character guy. Yeah, the main character, yeah, he was Canadian, if I remember yeah. correctly. Was his name Tommy or something like that? Character, yeah, because uh, Corey Feldman had played Tommy before in four. Uh huh. Right, right. So and then it was a different up. guy in five, and then it was a different guy in six. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, and, and wasn't five like uh, Jason's only? Uh, it wasn't real Jason. It was like an yeah, that was something Jason. when they were trying. That's why it was called New Chapter. They were trying something different. I think each movie was supposed to be another copycat, and he had to kind of figure out who the next one was. I think that's what they're going to start doing. But then it got like totally bashed, and everyone was like, "Yeah, you marked this as a Friday the Thirteenth, and it's not even Jason." And uh-huh. then, like you realize it until the very end, and you're like, "Well, oh, this guy's not as tall." Why is he backing up from a pitchfork? It's like, <laughs> uh, right? But, yeah, uh, my, my my brother told me like he really doesn't like part five. I don't remember disliking it that much or even getting the point that it was a different guy because uh, it was just still scary to me, right? Uh, and it still had the similar vibe to the other, to the other ones. Um, but yeah, six I remember was quite good. That that was like maybe one of the few that actually had real emotion in it. I mean, number four did. I remember six yeah. like had some emotional, like character development actually in it. And I, I think that was, that was the first time Jason was undead. The six. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's the first time he came back from oh, the I dead. See. He was still mm-hmm. alive in all the other ones. Oh the first okay. Because I think but, then they went for full eighties horror in that one. It was just over the top. <laughs> you had like the the glam metal in in, in there too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that one character who was like the supposed to be like the glam rocker type. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's hard for me to distinguish six and seven in my head right now, but um, I could definitely picture eight. Uh, and seven, five. seven was the girl who was like Carrie, because I think seven was originally supposed to be Jason versus Carrie. They couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. So they just, oh. the woman mm-hmm. in there who had like those abilities to move stuff with her mind. Oh, yeah, that was cool. That was cool when that, I remember like seeing like oh wow there's like he has a match yeah. almost like a... but it's weird it's like friday the 13th one to six their consistency is, is pretty solid oh uh, well even two through seven after seven like eight and up the, the consistencies were just so bad yeah yeah eight i remember just being very entertaining so i didn't know notice that it was because i was so young you know when i saw it I didn't each, really yeah each movie seven. continued where you left jason off where he was thought to be dead or whatever and then, like six, he um, he gets drowned in the water, and that's where the girl accidentally raises him from. He still has a chain around his neck, and the yellow mm-hmm. gloves are half rotted on him. And then all of a sudden, in in um, eight, Jason takes Manhattan. He has a full, well prepared green suit back on. That's the not <laughs> ripped at all. Right, the jumpsuit. Yeah, he just he just bought it out of the shop, and it's like it just got ridiculous and inconsistent. And then the, if you watch some of the interviews with the director on like this, just the Blu-rays and stuff. He, director kind of did that on purpose mm-hmm. <laughs> uh yeah I, I i'm i'm afraid to ask this question because <laughs> i'm not into it but uh deanna says what do you think about rob zombies halloween i liked it yeah i, I, I was i was never a big halloween fan to begin with really hmm. i was just i don't like that whole less is more idea for horror i'm not, <laughs> I'm not a fan of that there are mm-hmm. some horrors that do it really well and the only few that I do like are from Korea. Oh yeah, hmm. that do that. But uh, I mean, Halloween. It was it was basically Rob Zombie took Jason and put him in Michael Myers' mask. That's what you, oh, you thought. That, that's basically what it, it it is, but also slightly different. But I I liked it. Mm-hmm. I actually, like it more than the original. I know that's a sinful thing for a horror fan to say, <laughs> but <laughs> well, it's fair because you don't like the original so right, much. Yeah. So. And it it's def the my the. Rob Zombie one is definitely not the less is more approach at all. It's no, the more is more approach. It was so, which I guess why I didn't like it. It's yeah, not my, my cup of tea at all. Like I remember him smashing the ceiling and like with these loud noises, like giving me a heart attack for like five yeah. minutes. I'm like what the hell? But I, I can easily see why people didn't like it. I can I definitely see that. But <laughs> I, I loved yeah. it. I was a I was a big fan of Halloween one and two and up to up, up to five i guess i mean probably up to seven if you can't age too well but uh whatever well, yeah, yeah. After, yeah after four when they try to introduce that cult or whatever yeah i vaguely I remember, remember it and, i mean four i, I four I, I liked i liked halloween four I'll, I'll still watch that one occasionally but mm-hmm. like five and up it just got ridiculous <laughs> even right. by horror standards <laughs> right i mean three was ridiculous but and Kind of yeah. like the throwaway five in, in the Friday the 13th. Oh, series. yeah. So you're waiting for like Michael to come out and it's like, what the hell? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Very strange. 
Um, did you feel the Nightmare on Elm Street series were pretty good run? Or oh, yeah. were there some real clunkers in there for you? No, I like the run. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt it's it was... also another horror series that were actually pretty consistent from film to film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I felt like I didn't love one or the other too much. I mean, the first one was maybe the best, but uh, I thought, yeah. but... Uh... Oh, yeah, the first one is still two. And two is weird. I like it, but I don't watch that one as much. And I think mm -hmm. Dream Warriors is just fun to watch. Yeah. It's it's so stupid, but it's fun. Yeah, and the, the song is so good too. <laughs> yeah, the sound the soundtrack for that is is the eighties. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, I think yeah. he didn't have a song in that soundtrack if I remember correctly. Uh, who who did? I think Iron Maiden did have a song in that soundtrack. Oh wow! Do you know I which think, song? I can't remember. Wow, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> so Mike Amari says, "I know everyone hates it, but f part five is my favorite." I'm wondering. Uh, if he means oh Friday thirteenth part five, yeah, yeah I, I I could see I, I I don't I remember the is like uh, with rat tat 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 too the guy's fixing his car he's singing this song about rat tat or something <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah. remember that I don't know but yeah I like him in because he's also he's in Return of the Living Dead that actor oh yeah yeah uh, yeah if, if I had a favorite Friday thirteenth I'm not I feel like seven. I remember like six. I don't know. I mean, I don't really watch horror movies anymore. I really, I just think life itself uh, has too many horrible things yeah. in like the real news <laughs> that I don't want to like give myself any extra reason to be fearful. Well, that's where that's, yeah, that's where like supernatural horror comes in because you know that's not real. Yeah. When you watch something along the lines of like Saw, you'd be like, someone can snap and actually do this. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's. Yeah, I remember always feeling like this sense of comfort watching those, the ones with the horror movies are talking about, uh, because it felt very unreal. Especially 80s horror. It was just so over the top. Yeah. Like, ridiculous, but fun. Yeah. Like you forget, to be, you forget to be scared. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Friday, Friday 13th, it's today. Uh, I remember it was a big deal when I was younger or when we were younger. If Friday 13th was coming, I'm sure there'll be horror movie watching, which which I don't know, you might be doing it now. Mike, Mike's doing it now. So <laughs> you might do it tonight, who knows? But I'll be, I'm going to put part six on later. Part just, six, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, Deanna says The Silenced. Uh, I don't know if that's a movie or not. I heard of that one. I haven't seen it yet. Hmm. Is Did that recent? Look? I don't know. Deanna's hmm. the silence recent. Uh, did you uh, did you like Salem's Lot? Oh, the original, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I can only watch the first part of the remake, and I was like, I'm out. Yeah, I, I don't know. There's a remake. Uh, yeah, it was like a two part series on, on TV, like a while while back. Mm -hmm. What about uh, Fright Night? Did you like part one and two of those? Part one, yes. Part two, I liked as a kid, and I watched it again as an adult. No, no, <laughs> just, I couldn't get through it. <laughs> but oh, part okay. one, classic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Deanna says the silence is Korean, two thousand fourteen ish, two thousand fifteen. So good, she said. Yeah, I think that's on my list. If I remember correctly, if it's the Korean movie I'm thinking of, then yeah, I have it on my list somewhere for me to watch it. Mm -hmm. Some or I'm backlogged on that's why i started the october thing but then by the time the next october comes around there's already too much harder to catch up with <laughs> yeah yeah man I, I haven't watched horror movie a genuine horror movie in i don't know how many years i just i just got started to get too scared oh, that's um, understandable you know not not liking nightmare i'm a very sensitive guy so like my energy very energetically sensitive and yeah, I try to be careful what I put in my brain. <clears throat> right. I, mean, I think I also like about horror movies over like real life horrors is, is there's always a solution in the horror movies. Like eventually mm -hmm. you figure out the puzzle to destroy what you need to destroy. Sometimes too late. Sometimes it's just on time. But mm -hmm. there's always there's always the solution. Yeah. Do, do you think is there any, any horror movie that sticks out as being like uh, having a sort of a good message or, or not really? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, 
I mean, I'm sure they all do on some level. And, uh, yeah, there's something to learn. Like Evil Dead, just, you know, don't read shit that... Uh, <laughs> Don't that's not in English that so you don't know what's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess a lot of it's a lot, it's basically cautionary tale, most of it, yeah. right? Don't I mean, yeah, I think we had it like a long time ago. I think it was at a Cradle of Phil show. I mean, you had a discussion how like Friday the 13th is very Republican. <laughs> but it's like, it's very like if you're, if you're a teenager who does drugs and has sex, you're going to get killed. <laughs> that's pretty much, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, even like uh, what's what's the roots of America, like... Um, what am I thinking? Like not the Pilgrims, but uh, quite Quaker. Like almost like um, like, is it Quaker? What I'm looking for. This like very strict. Oh, Protestant. Yeah, very Protestant sort of mm-hmm. like uh, religious values, right? If God God will strike you down if you fornicate, right, right, and, and drink, then it's it's really it's in there. It's it's really in there, which is kind of maybe why it was like accepted by. Uh, adults on some level it's like yeah it's hard they shouldn't show this stuff but they're punishing the evildoers so i guess yeah yeah it's okay (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah but yeah i remember those type of conversations yeah it was a cradle phil show too maybe even Mm -hmm. one at the tramps maybe it would have been because i really don't remember seeing them more than once i I feel like yeah either there or maybe at like a mcdonald's nearby afterwards we hung out or something like that i don't remember exactly where we were speaking but no it was in yeah. tramps like uh oh, at the show any, band, any of the bands went on oh okay up there i think we just saw each other like, oh. and somehow we got into the topic of friday the 13th <laughs> <laughs> and how yeah. republican it is <laughs> right interesting that's <laughs> funny and uh mike amari says um like passion plays <laughs> nightmare on elm street was a bit more punk they literally attack the suburban Republican dream. And then Deanna said, John, then do not watch Korean horror. I always had a feeling when you even mentioned it. I don't know why, but I think I've saw a few Korean movies and I, I would definitely not dare. I would not dare to watch it because I'm like, sure I'm, it would freak yeah, me I'm, out. I'm also not a fan of like the, um, the psycho, psycho, the psycho drama. drama horror. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's two Korean films that did it like superbly, and one is called Spider Forest, and the other one, if I remember correctly, is called Red Shoes or The mm-hmm. Red Shoes. And the interesting thing about The Red Shoes, I've never found a, the supernatural version of it. Par- supposedly, they filmed two versions of the movie, one where it ends with a the lead person was just seeing everything in her head and did all the stuff herself. And another one was the actual ghost. Mm-hmm. And the way to tell that you were watching them was the, the psycho one was bloody and the ghost supernatural one wasn't. So, but I never saw the super, I could never find it anywhere. So I'm thinking it was just like maybe a rumor or whatever. <laughs> Cause I, I never found it anywhere, but the, the psycho drama one, I actually did enjoy. And uh, so far on that, that genre, only the, to me, for me, only the Koreans have done the best hmm. wow yeah I, I remember i i saw what, what's it called um uh what's his name who's the guy who plays gladiator Russell Russell Crow. Crow, right yeah what's the movie a beautiful mind was that him oh yeah 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 that, that freaked me out man uh because <laughs> you don't know what's real right and uh yeah, yeah, yeah. that there was a few like chilling moments for me because like what the fuck does anything mean at all you know i don't know i don't like going down that <laughs> no, that, <yeah>. road. <laughs> that that's a whole rabbit hole in itself <laughs> yeah that was that was freaky so uh if if you'd like to share what are your plans in the upcoming several months what are you focusing on these days well i'll definitely gonna be training a lot more and getting into better shape that's my goal right now is my, my main goal is to, right now is to get as close as a body type to Bruce Lee as I possibly can at my age. <laughs> nice. It's not going to be easy, but I'm, I'm ready for it. That's a worthy goal, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. And not to start mm-hmm. playing guitar again. And I haven't played in a long while. Maybe, well, not long, long, maybe about a year. Mm-hmm. Last time I picked the guitar up. Yeah. 
I'm definitely going to start that up again. And I'm curious, what, what kind of music would you play? Like, would you start strumming a G chord or you go right into a riff? Oh, I'm like, uh, right now I'm trying to find a decently priced hurdy gurdy to buy. Hmm. I want to, I want to work with that and a mandola, which a teardrop mandola, which I cannot find anywhere. Every time I go to a music shop, they're like, oh, do you mean like a mandolin? I'm like, no, 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 a mandola. <laughs> Not a mandolin, mandola. But hmm. I don't yeah. know, I can't find them. <laughs> I feel yeah. like I want those two just to start getting an idea how it is to write folk metal. And I don't want to just approach it from a guitar player standpoint. I want to mm -hmm. do it from that other standpoint too, from a hurdy gurdy and the mandola. I'm mm -hmm. not going to bother trying to learn the violin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. <laughs> it's a great yeah. instrument, but I just I think, I don't know. I don't think it's for me. It's quite different, man. Yeah, it's it, people I think might who don't know anything about either instrument would assume violin and guitar are kind of in the same family, but yeah. not at all. Not at all. No. Um, Deanna says, you can do it. Awesome. <laughs> Best of success. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, definitely. It's not going to be easy, but mm. worth the stuff that's worth it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. And that, that's such a unique drive like I, you know, I definitely never met someone who said i want to play the hurdy-gurdy i never knew what it was until you told me about it so um yeah i mean you've seen it it's an instrument you crank and you play and mm -hmm. yeah see it. I, at this point i've seen it yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah i'm sure you could do it and it's mandola yeah right, mandola what mandola looks like a mandolin guitar yeah it, it kind of does but it, it's called the mandola, but other people say it's called, it's it's really an octave mandolin. Uh -huh, so you have okay. Mandolin, then you have octave mandolin. So I guess the octave mandolin and mandola sounds similar. That they, I guess they're considered the same. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just I can't find anyone with enough knowledge on it to uh, <laughs> explain it to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, like uh, a violin and a fiddle are the same thing, right? It, right. They seem like different things because of the context, but it's technically just different yeah. cultures call it differently basically <laughs> and mike amari wants a harp guitar mm. yeah mm. <laughs> that's cool that you guys have musical aspirations i actually don't have any besides wanting to put out more of the music i already made right record a little bit more i mean that's cool but you you found your like what you like doing with music like you like mm. playing guitar like i didn't discover these new instruments until like 2010. <laughs> right Mm -hmm. I wish I did when I was younger. My probably wouldn't have made me come close to finding a hurdy gurdy. I mean, the cheapest <laughs> hurdy gurdy I could find is like three thousand dollars. <laughs> oh, really? And it's like ah, I can't afford that right now. <laughs> wow. So. And this is something you'd have to buy online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they heavy? Oh. I mean, there there's ones that are big that has like three different modes to it, and they have like the smaller ones that have like one mode. But uh, if you look up there, um, Elevati's first hurdy gurdy player, Anna Murphy, she has like an instructional video she, where she breaks down how the hurdy gurdy works and how each mode of it works. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Pretty cool. So from, from what I gather, it's a bit like a bagpipe in the sense that the bagpipe you fill up with there and you got to push it. And right. in this case, you just kind of pump it to get the air yeah, going. Yeah, it's, it's got strings in it too. And so oh, it has yeah. like three different modes. Like one mode, I'm trying to remember exactly what she said. One mode is for like the long violin sounding. And then you can do like one mode where it's like uh where you could do like different beats with it. Like uh like the new Hardy Gurdy play, she does like a like a duel with the guitars. And like I didn't know you could do that with Hardy Gurdy with one of the modes. Mm -hmm. so you have like a lead mode, you have a rhythm mode, and um I can't remember what the other one is. It's been a long time since I watched that video, but it's like three different things you can do with it, and three different sounds. And one of them, one of them it does sound like a bagpipe sometimes. Sometimes it sounds like a violin. Cool. Oh. Mm. I'll put that in the show notes too for anyone and a mandola. Uh, sometimes I put links to everything, but we talked about so many things. Uh, I'm just going to put the words, <laughs> <laughs> maybe a link on some highlights. But yeah. Cool, Jason. This has been a lot of fun, man. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed it a lot.
<laughs> yeah, I'm glad uh, you're up, you're game for it. And then who knows, maybe one day we'll do a part two to this. Yeah, yeah. After Absolutely. you watch, after you watch thirty-one more horror movies, and you have more to, <laughs> to share. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, cool, man. So uh, I'm gonna let you go. I'll send you the link, this link plus the uh, YouTube link, just yeah, yeah. so you have a free reference of the archive yeah, version. Share, it. share it too. Yeah, feel free to share it. That'd be awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna let you go and uh, have a great night. Thank you so much Dude. for being part of it. Oh, thank you. For <laughs> All right, Jason, be well and He's talk to you man. soon. All right, have a good one. Thanks, everybody. Yes, good night, everyone who's in the chat. Take care, guys. All right.